Hello there, and welcome to my live reading of Roald Dahl's The Witches. So I recorded this over a series of live streams, and I've mishmashed all the chapters together with a little bit of chat from the live streams, um, as well as some picture time where I show you each of the pictures from each of the chapters as I go along as well. So, I really, really hope you enjoy it. Um, it's supposed to be a relaxing reading of an absolutely wonderful book by an incredible children's author, but an author that is loved by children and adults alike across the world. So whether you're familiar with this story, or whether this is the first time you're ever hearing this or reading this, I really, really hope you enjoy it. And I say it was supposed to be a relaxing reading. It is a Roald Dahl book after all, and for those of you that do know Roald Dahl's stories, whether through the films or through the books, wow, it's, it's hard to keep it just a calm, relaxing read. And I don't think, as someone said in one of the live streams, I don't think Roald Dahl himself would probably want it to be too tame. These are very fun books after all, so, you know, things get a little bit wild here and there. <laughs> but I really, really hope you enjoy it. So. The Witches. By Roald Dahl. A note about witches. In fairy tales, witches always wear silly black hats and black cloaks, and they ride on broomsticks. But this is not a fairy tale. This is about real witches. The most important thing you should know about real witches is this. Listen very carefully. Never forget what is coming next. Real witches dress in ordinary clothes and look very much like ordinary women. They live in ordinary houses and they work in ordinary jobs. That is why they are so hard to catch. A real witch hates children with a red-hot sizzling hatred that is more sizzling and red-hot than any hatred you could possibly imagine. A real witch spends all her time plotting to get rid of the children in her particular territory. Her passion is to do away with them, one by one. It is all she thinks about the whole day long, even if she is working as a cashier in a supermarket, or typing letters for a businessman, or driving round in a fancy car, and she could be doing any of these things. Her mind will always be plotting and scheming, and churning and burning, and whizzing and fizzing, with murderous, bloodthirsty thoughts. Which child, she says to herself all day long, exactly which child shall I choose for my next squelching? A real witch gets the same pleasure from squelching a child as you get from eating a plateful of strawberries and thick cream. She reckons on doing away with one child a week, anything less than that, and she becomes grumpy. One child a week is fifty-two a year. Squish them and squiggle them and make them disappear. 
That is the motto of all witches. Very carefully a victim is chosen. Then the witch stalks the wretched child like a hunter stalking a little bird in the forest. She treads softly. She moves quietly. She gets closer and closer. Then at last, when everything is ready, she swoops. Sparks fly, flames leap, oil boils, rats howl, skin shrivels. And the child disappears. A witch, you must understand, does not knock children on the head or stick knives into them or shoot at them with a pistol. People who do those things get caught by the police. A witch never gets caught. Don't forget that she has magic in her fingers and devilry dancing in her blood. She can make stones jump about like frogs, and she can make tongues of flame go flickering across the surface of the water. These magic powers are very frightening. Luckily, there are not a great number of real witches in the world today, but there are still quite enough to make you nervous. In England, there are probably about 100 of them altogether, Some countries have more, others have not quite so many. No country in the world is completely free from witches. A witch is always a woman. I do not wish to speak badly about women. Most women are lovely. But the fact remains that all witches are women. There is no such thing as a male witch. On the other hand, a ghoul is always a male, so indeed is a bar guest. Both are dangerous, but neither of them is half as dangerous as a real witch. As far as children are concerned, a real witch is easily the most dangerous of all the living creatures on earth. What makes her doubly dangerous is the fact that she doesn't look dangerous, Even when you know all the secrets, you'll hear about those in a minute, you can still never be quite sure whether it is a witch you are gazing at or just a kind lady. If a tiger were able to make himself look like a large dog with a waggy tail, you would probably go up and pat him on the head. And that would be the end of you. It is the same with witches. They all look like nice ladies. Kindly examine the picture below. Which lady is the witch? Well, it is a difficult question, but it is one that every child must try to answer. For all you know, a witch might be living next door to you right now. Or she might be the woman with the bright eyes who sat opposite you on the bus this morning. She might be the lady with the dazzling smile who offered you a sweet from a white paper bag in the street before lunch. She might even, and this will make you jump, she might even be your lovely school teacher, who is reading these words to you at this very moment. Look carefully at that teacher. Perhaps she is smiling at the absurdity of such a suggestion. Don't let that put you off. It could be part of her cleverness. I am not, of course, telling you for one second that your teacher actually is a witch. All I am saying is that she might be one. It is most unlikely. But, and here comes the big but, it is not impossible. Ah, 
If only there were a way of telling for sure whether a woman was a witch or not. Then we could round them all up and put them in the meat grinder. Unhappily, there is no such way. But there are a number of little signals you can look out for. Little quirky habits that all witches have in common. And if you know about these, if you remember them always, then you might just possibly manage to escape from being squelched before you are very much older. My grandmother. I myself had two separate encounters with witches before I was eight years old. From the first I escaped unharmed, but on the second occasion I was not so lucky. Things happened to me that will probably make you scream when you read about them. That can't be helped. The truth must be told. The fact that I am still here and able to speak to you, however peculiar I may look, is due entirely to my wonderful grandmother. My grandmother was Norwegian. The Norwegians know all about witches, for Norway, with its black forests and icy mountains, is where the first witches came from. My father and my mother were also Norwegian, but because my father had a business in England, I had been born there and had lived there and had started going to an English school. Twice a year, at Christmas and in the summer, we went back to Norway to visit my grandmother. This old lady, as far as I could gather, was just about the only surviving relative we had on either side of our family. She was my mother's mother, and I absolutely adored her. When she and I were together, we spoke in either Norwegian or in English. It didn't matter which. We were equally fluent in both languages. And I have to admit that I felt closer to her than to my mother. Soon after my seventh birthday, my parents took me as usual to spend Christmas with my grandmother in Norway, and it was over there, while my father and mother and I were driving in icy weather just north of Oslo, that our car skidded off the road and went tumbling down to a rocky ravine. My parents were killed. I was firmly strapped into the back seat and received only a cut on the forehead. I won't go into the horrors of that terrible afternoon. I still get the shivers when I think about it. I finished up, of course, back in my grandmother's house with her arms around me tight, and both of us crying the whole night long. What are we going to do now? I asked her through the tears. You will stay here with me, she said, and I will look after you. Aren't I going back to England? No, she said. I could never do that. Heaven shall take my soul, but Norway shall keep my bones. The very next day, in order that we might both try to forget our great sadness, my grandmother started telling me stories. She was a wonderful storyteller, and I was enthralled by everything she told me. But I didn't become really excited until she got on to the subject of witches. She was apparently a great expert on these creatures, and she made it very clear to me that her witch stories unlike most of the others, were not imaginary tales. They were all true. 
They were the gospel truth. They were history. Everything she was telling me about witches had actually happened, and I had better believe it. What was worse, what was far, far worse, was that witches were still with us. They were all around us, and I had better believe that too. Are you really being truthful, Grandmama? Really and truly truthful? My darling, she said, you won't last long in this world if you don't know how to spot a witch when you see one. But you told me that witches look like ordinary women, Grandmama, so how can I spot them? You must listen to me, my grandmother said. You must remember everything I tell you. After that, all you can do is cross your heart and pray to heaven and hope for the best. We were in the big living room of her house in Oslo, and I was ready for bed. The curtains were never drawn in that house, and through the windows I could see huge snowflakes falling slowly onto an outside world that was as black as tar. My grandmother was tremendously old and wrinkled, with a massive wide body which was smothered in grey lace. She sat there, majestic in her armchair, filling every inch of it. Not even a mouse could have squeezed in to sit beside her. I myself, just seven years old, was crouched on the floor at her feet, wearing pyjamas dressing gown and slippers. You swear you aren't pulling my leg? I kept saying to her. You swear you aren't just pretending? Listen, she said. I have known no less than five children who have simply vanished off the face of this earth, never to be seen again. The witches took them. I still think you're just trying to frighten me, I said. I am trying to make sure you don't go the same way, she said. I love you, and I want you to stay with me. Tell me about the children who disappeared, I said. My grandmother was the only grandmother I ever met who smoked cigars. She lit one now, a long black cigar that smelt of burning rubber. The first child I knew who disappeared, she said, was called Ranghild Hansen. Ranghild was about eight at the time, and she was playing with her little sister on the lawn. Their mother who was baking bread in the kitchen, came outside for a breath of air. Where's Ranghild? she asked. She went away with the tall lady, the little sister said. What tall lady? the mother said. The tall lady in white gloves, the little sister said. She took Ranghild by the hand and led her away. No one, my grandmother said, ever saw Ranghild again. Didn't they search for her? I asked. They searched for miles around. Everyone in the town helped, but they never found her. What happened to the other four children? I asked. They vanished just as Ranghild did. How, Grandmama? How did they vanish? In every case, a strange lady was seen outside the house, just before it happened. But how did they vanish? I asked. 
The second one was very peculiar, my grandmother said. There was a family called Christiansen. They lived up on Holmen Colin, and they had an old oil painting in the living room, which they were very proud of. The painting showed some ducks in the yard outside a farmhouse. There were no people in the painting, just a flock of ducks on a grassy farmyard and the farmhouse in the background. It was a large painting and rather pretty. Well, one day their daughter, Solveig, came home from school eating an apple. She said a nice lady had given it to her on the street. The next morning, little Solveig was not in her bed. The parents searched everywhere, but they couldn't find her. Then, all of a sudden, her father shouted, There she is! That's Solveig feeding the ducks! He was pointing at the oil painting. And sure enough, Solveig was in it. She was standing in the farmyard in the act of throwing bread to the ducks out of a basket. The father rushed up to the painting and touched her. But that didn't help. She was simply a part of the painting. Just a picture painted on the canvas. Did you ever see that painting, Grandmama? With the little girl in it? Many times, my grandmother said. And the peculiar thing was that little Solveig kept changing her position in the picture. One day she would actually be inside the farmhouse and you could see her face looking out of the window. Another day she would be far off to the left with a duck in her arms. Did you see her moving in the picture, Grandmama? Nobody did. Wherever she was, whether outside feeding the ducks or inside looking out of the window, she was always motionless, just a figure painted in oils. It was all very odd my grandmother said. Very odd indeed. And what was most odd of all was that as the years went by she kept getting older in the picture. In ten years the small girl had become a young woman. In thirty years she was middle-aged. Then all at once Fifty-four years after it all happened, she disappeared from the picture altogether. You mean she died? I said. Who knows? My grandmother said. Some very mysterious things go on in the world of witches. That's two you've told me about, I said. What happened to the third one? The third one was little Birgit Svensson, my grandmother said. She lived just across the road from us. One day, she started growing feathers all over her body. Within a month... She had turned into a large white chicken. Her parents kept her for years in a pen in the garden. She even laid eggs. What colour eggs? I said. Brown ones, my grandmother said. Biggest eggs I've ever seen in my life. Her mother made omelettes out of them. Delicious they were. I gazed up at my grandmother, who sat there like some ancient queen on her throne. Her eyes were misty grey, 
and they seemed to be looking at something many miles away. The cigar was the only real thing about her at that moment, and the smoke it made billowed round her head in blue clouds. But the little girl who became a chicken didn't disappear, I said. No, not Birgit. She lived on for many years, laying her brown eggs. You said all of them disappeared. I made a mistake, my grandmother said. I am getting old. I can't remember everything. What happened to the fourth child? I asked. The fourth? Was a boy called Harald, my grandmother said. One morning, his skin went all greyish-yellow. Then it became hard and crackly, like the shell of a nut. By evening, the boy had turned to stone. Stone? I said. You mean real stone? Granite, she said. I'll take you to see him if you like. They still keep him in the house. He stands in the hall, a little stone statue. Visitors lean their umbrellas up against him. Although I was very young, I was not prepared to believe everything my grandmother told me. And yet she spoke with such conviction, with such utter seriousness and with never a smile on her face or a twinkle in her eye, that I found myself beginning to wonder. Go on, Grandmama, I said. You told me there were five altogether. What happened to the last one? Would you like a puff of my cigar? She said. I'm only seven, Grandmama. I don't care what age you are, she said. You'll never catch a cold if you smoke cigars. What about number five, Grandmama? <sighs> number five, she said, chewing the end of her cigar as though it were a delicious asparagus was rather an interesting case. A nine-year-old boy called Leif was summer holidaying with his family on the fjord and the whole family was picnicking and swimming off some rocks on one of those little islands. Young Leif dived into the water and his father, who was watching him, Notice that he stayed under for an unusually long time. When he came to the surface at last, he wasn't Leif anymore. What was he, Grandmama? He was a porpoise. He wasn't. He couldn't have been. He was a lovely young porpoise she said, and as friendly as could be. Grandmama, I said. Yes, my darling? Did he really and truly turn into a porpoise? Absolutely, she said. I knew his mother well. She told me all about it. She told me how Leif the porpoise stayed with them all that afternoon giving his brothers and sisters rides on his backs. They had a wonderful time. Then he waved a flipper at them and swam away, never to be seen again. But Grandmama, I said, how did they know that the porpoise was actually Leif? He talked to them, my grandmother said. He laughed and joked with them all the time he was giving them rides. But... Wasn't there a most tremendous fuss when this happened? I asked. Not much, my grandmother said. 
You must remember that here in Norway we are used to that sort of thing. There are witches everywhere. There's probably one living in our street this very moment. It's time you went to bed. A witch wouldn't come in through my window in the night, would she? I asked, quaking a little. No, my grandmother said. A witch will never do silly things like climbing up drain pipes or breaking into people's houses. You'll be quite safe in your bed. Come along. I'll tuck you in. How are we doing, Fox fans in the chat? That's the end of chapter two. For those of you not familiar, like I said, a very peculiar story, but rather a wonderful one, I think. Uh, I missed a couple of pictures there, by the way, and I know my camera isn't the clearest, but here is grandmother with the boy these uh, very famous illustrations by Quentin Blake by the way and here's the alarmed dad spotting Solveig in the painting how horrifying that must be and then we have poor old Birgit, the little chicken, laying her eggs forever and ever. <laughs> That's nice. Lynette and Olivia and Katie, Shannon. Oh, and hi to Beata as well. And thank you, Mango. Hope you're enjoying it, everybody. And then we have poor Leif. Poor Leif. Now an umbrella stand. Dark Norwegian humour there. Gosh. Ah, uh, well. Looks like our life's been turned into a statue. Might as well uh, make him useful. He's not going to be making us cups of tea and sandwiches. And and uh, brushing the leaves outside in the garden anymore. So Might as well use him as an umbrella stand. Not wasting that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I think more, all the more ugly now he's been turned to stone. Because it's changed his skin as well. His skin went hard and crackly like the shell of a nut. With the witch's magic. Oh wait, was Leaf? Sorry, Leaf the porpoise. Yeah, sorry, this was Harald. Sorry, sorry, this is Harald the, the wrinkly kid and here is leaf the porpoise definitely getting the best deal of the bunch seems rather cheery the family didn't seem to mind too much either yeah i could live with that especially if you can talk like you basically no human problems uh you can swim around uh in, in the North Sea, off the coast of Norway. Enjoy the fjords, the nature. I mean, if it doesn't even affect your life expectancy, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that was a good witch. Maybe she did him a deal, you know? Yeah. But you've enjoyed the first two chapters, that's the main thing. Seems like you're having a good time. Alright, so... 
Here we go at last, at long last. Thank you for your patience, boys and girls. Settle down now, please, settle down. Let's be quiet in the classroom. No more messing around there at the back, thank you. How to recognize a witch. The next evening, after my grandmother had given me my bath, she took me once again into the living room for another story. Tonight, the old woman said, I am going to tell you how to recognize a witch when you see one. Can you always be sure? I asked. No, she said, you can't. And that's the trouble, but you can make a pretty good guess. She was dropping cigar ash all over her lap, and I hoped she wasn't going to catch on fire before she told me how to recognise a witch. In the first place, she said, a real witch is certain always to be wearing gloves when you meet her. Surely not always, I said. What about in the summer when it's hot? Even in the summer, my grandmother said. She has to. Do you want to know why? Why? I said. Because she doesn't have fingernails. Instead of fingernails, she has thin curvy claws like a cat, and she wears the gloves to hide them. Mind you, lots of very respectable women wear gloves, especially in winter, so this doesn't help you very much. Mama used to wear gloves, I said. Not in the house, my grandmother said. Witches wear gloves even in the house. They only take them off when they go to bed. How do you know all this, Grandmama? Don't interrupt, she said. Just take it all in. The second thing to remember is that a real witch is always bald. Bald? I said. Bald as a boiled egg, my grandmother said. I was shocked. There was something indecent about a bald woman. Why are they bald, Grandmama? Don't ask me why, she snapped. But you can take it from me that not a single hair grows on a witch's head. How horrid! Disgusting, my grandmother said. If she's bald, she'll be easy to spot, I said. Not at all, my grandmother said. A real witch always wears a wig to hide her baldness. She wears a first-class wig. And it is almost impossible to tell a really first-class wig from ordinary hair unless you give it a pull to see if it comes off. Then that's what I'll have to do, I said. Don't be foolish, my grandmother said. You can't go round pulling at the hair of every lady you meet, even if she is wearing gloves. Just you try it and see what happens. So that doesn't help much either, I said. None of these things is any good on its own, my grandmother said. It's only when you put them all together they begin to make a little sense. Mind you, my grandmother went on, these wigs do cause a rather serious problem for witches. What problem, Grandmama? They make the scalp itch most terribly, she said. You see, 
When an actress wears a wig, or if you or I were to wear a wig, we would be putting it on over our own hair. But a witch has to put it straight onto her naked scalp. And the underneath of a wig is always very rough and scratchy. It sets up a frightful itch on the bald skin. It causes nasty sores on the head. Wig rash, the witches call it. And it doesn't half itch. What other things must I look for to recognise a witch? I asked. Look for the nose holes, my grandmother said. Witches have slightly larger nose holes than ordinary people. The rim of each nose hole is pink and curvy, like the rim of a certain kind of seashell. Why do they have such big nose holes? I asked. For smelling with, my grandmother said. A real witch has the most amazing powers of smell. She can actually smell out a child who is standing on the other side of the street on a pitch black night. She couldn't smell me, I said. I've just had a bath. Oh, yes, she could, my grandmother said. The cleaner you happen to be, the more smelly you are to a witch. That can't be true, I said. An absolutely clean child gives off the most ghastly stench to a witch, my grandmother said. The dirtier you are, the less you smell. But that doesn't make sense, Grandmama. Oh, yes, it does, my grandmother said. It isn't the dirt that a witch is smelling. It is you. The smell that drives a witch mad actually comes right out of your own skin. It comes oozing out of your skin in waves, and these waves, stink waves, the witches call them, go floating through the air and hit the witch right smack in her nostrils. They send her reeling. Now wait a minute, Grandmama. Don't interrupt, she said. The point is this. When you haven't washed for a week and your skin is all covered over with dirt, then quite obviously the stink waves cannot come oozing out nearly so strongly. I shall never have a bath again, I said. Just don't have one too often, my grandmother said. Once a month is quite enough for a sensible child. It was at moments like these that I loved my grandmother more than ever. Grandmama, I said, if it's a dark night, how can a witch smell the difference between a child and a grown-up? Because grown-ups don't give out stink waves, she said. Only children do that. But I don't really give out sting waves, do I? I said. I'm not giving them out at this very moment, am I? Not to me, you aren't, my grandmother said. To me, you are smelling like raspberries and cream. But to a witch... You would be smelling absolutely disgusting. What would I be smelling of? I asked. Dog's droppings, my grandmother said. I reeled. I was stunned. Dog's droppings? I cried. I am not smelling of dog's droppings. I don't believe it. I won't believe it. What's more, my grandmother said, speaking with a touch of relish. To a witch, you'd be smelling of fresh dog's droppings. 
that simply is not true, I cried. I know I am not smelling of dog's droppings, stale or fresh. There's no point in arguing about it, my grandmother said. It's a fact of life. I was outraged. I simply couldn't bring myself to believe what my grandmother was telling me. So, if you see a woman holding her nose as she passes you in the street, she went on, that woman could easily be a witch. I decided to change the subject. Tell me what else to look for in a witch, I said. The eyes, my grandmother said. Look carefully at the eyes, because the eyes of a real witch are different from yours and mine. Look in the middle of each eye where there is normally a little black dot. If she is a witch, the black dot will keep changing colour, and you will see fire, and you will see ice, dancing right in the very centre of the coloured dot. It will send shivers running all over your skin. My grandmother leaned back in her chair and sucked away contentedly at her foul black cigar. I squatted on the floor, staring up at her, fascinated. She was not smiling. She looked deadly serious. There's grandmother in the chair with the black cigar. Are there other things? I asked her. Of course there are other things, my grandmother said. You don't seem to understand that witches are not actually women at all. They look like women, they talk like women, and they are able to act like women. But in actual fact, they are totally different animals. They are demons in human shape. That is why they have claws and bald heads and queer noses and peculiar eyes, all of which they have to conceal as best they can from the rest of the world. What else is different about them, Grandmama? The feet, she said. Witches never have toes. No toes? I cried. Then what do they have? They just have feet, my grandmother said. The feet have square ends with no toes on them at all. Does that make it difficult to walk? I asked. Not at all, my grandmother said. But it does give them a problem with their shoes. All ladies like to wear small, rather pointed shoes, but a witch, whose feet are very wide and square at the ends, has the most awful job squeezing her feet into those neat little pointed shoes. Why doesn't she wear wide, comfy shoes with square ends? I asked. She dare not. My grandmother said. Just as she hides her baldness with a wig, she must also hide her ugly witch's feet by squeezing them into pretty shoes. Isn't that terribly uncomfortable? I said. Extremely uncomfortable, my grandmother said. But she has to put up with it. If she's wearing ordinary shoes, it won't help me to recognise her, will it, Grandmama? I'm afraid it won't, my grandmother said. You might possibly see her limping very slightly, but only if you are watching closely. Are those the only differences then, Grandmama? 
there's one more, my grandmother said. Just one more. What is it, Grandmama? Their spit is blue. Blue? I cried. Not blue. Their spit can't be blue. Blue as a bilberry, she said. You don't mean it, Grandmama. Nobody can have blue spit. Witches can, she said. Is it like ink? I asked. Exactly, she said. They even use it to write with. They use those old-fashioned pens that have nibs and they simply lick the nib. Can you notice the blue spit, Grandmama? If a witch was talking to me, would I be able to notice it? Only if you looked carefully, my grandmother said. If you looked very carefully, you would see probably a slight bluish tinge on her teeth. But it doesn't show much. Here's the witch and the pen. Very handy if you happen to run out of pen, paper or ink. Just need to have some paper handy. It would if she spat, I said. Witches never spit, my grandmother said. They daren't. I couldn't believe my grandmother would be lying to me. She went to church every morning of the week and she said grace before every meal. And somebody who did that would never tell lies. I was beginning to believe every word she spoke. So there you are, my grandmother said. That's about all I can tell you. None of it is very helpful. You can still never be absolutely sure whether a woman is a witch or not just by looking at her. But if she is wearing the gloves, if she has the large nose holes, the queer eyes, and the hair that looks as though it might be a wig, and if she has a bluish tinge on her teeth, if she has all of these things, then you run like mad. Grandmama, I said, when you were a little girl, did you ever meet a witch? Once, my grandmother said. Only once. What happened? I'm not going to tell you, she said. It would frighten you out of your skin and give you bad dreams. Please tell me, I begged. No, she said. Certain things are too horrible to talk about. Does it have something to do with your missing thumb? I asked. Suddenly, her old wrinkled lips shut tight as a pair of tongs, and the hand that held the cigar, which had no thumb on it, began to quiver very slightly. I waited. She didn't look at me. She didn't speak. All of a sudden, she had shut herself off completely. The conversation was finished. Good night, Grandmama, I said, rising from the floor and kissing her on the cheek. She didn't move. I crept out of the room and went to my bedroom. What happened?
happened to that poor old grandmama? I wonder if we'll find out. So that was chapter three, how to recognize a witch. Shall we move on to chapter four, Fox fans? Hope we're enjoying this fun little story. I know it's sort of a children's book, but I think it's still a lovely read and hopefully it's very nice to listen to. Just a nice little distraction, a nice little bit of company. How are we doing before I start chapter four? Ah, oh, hi, Anki Anka. Nice to see you. I didn't realize you'd popped in. I don't think I said hello to you earlier, at least. Oh, and I was just seeing there was a comment through Facebook earlier as well from Lang. Saying that she'd really enjoyed my Harry Potter readings back in the day. That's very nice. <laughs> yeah, I agree, to be honest, Wolf. Like, with with so many children's books, I really feel that they are books for anyone, you know, it just depends how you, how you approach them, really. I hope the video didn't freeze for you, but it can do that sometimes, uh, unfortunately I've noticed that a few times when watching back the recorded stream, even if it looked smooth for me at the time, and maybe it's smooth for someone and not smooth for somebody else, and sometimes it can save little jumps and things in the in the stream, unfortunately, it's just one of those things with live connections. Happens sometimes. Alright, but I'll press on with chapter four. I'm really glad you seem to be enjoying it. Okay. Chapter four. Of Roald Dahl's The Witches. The Grand High Witch. The next day, a man in a black suit arrived at the house carrying a briefcase, and he held a long conversation with my grandmother in the living room. I was not allowed in while he was there, but when at last he went away, my grandmother came in to me, walking very slowly and looking very sad. That man was reading me your father's will, she said. What is a will? I asked her. It is something you write before you die, she said, and in it you say who is going to have your money and your property. But most important of all, it says who is going to look after your child if both the mother and father are dead. A fearful panic took hold of me. It did say you, Grandmama, I cried. I don't have to go to somebody else, do I? No, she said. Your father would never have done that. He has asked me to take care of you for as long as I live, but he has also asked that I take you back to your own house in England. He wants us to stay there. But why? I said. Why can't we stay here in Norway? I would hate to live anywhere else. You told me you would. I know, she said. But there are a lot of complications with money and with the house that you wouldn't understand. Also, it said in the will that although all your family is Norwegian, you were born in England and you have started your education there, and he wants you to continue going to English schools. Oh, Grandmama, I cried. You don't want to go and live in our English house, I know you don't. Of course I don't, she said, but I am afraid I must. The will said that your mother felt the same way about it, and it 
it is important to respect the wishes of the parents. There was no way out of it. We had to go to England. My grandmother started making arrangements at once. Your next school term begins in a few days, she said, so we don't have any time to waste. On the evening before we left for England, my grandmother got onto her favourite subject once again. There are not as many witches in England as there are in Norway, she said. I'm sure I won't meet one, I said. I sincerely hope you won't, she said, because those English witches are probably the most vicious in the whole world. As she sat there smoking her foul cigar and talking away, I kept looking at the hand with the missing thumb. I couldn't help it. I was fascinated by it, and I kept wondering what awful thing had happened that time when she had met a witch. It must have been something absolutely appalling and gruesome, otherwise she would have told me about it. Maybe the thumb had been twisted off. Or perhaps she had been forced to jam her thumb down the spout of a boiling kettle until it was steamed away. Or did someone pull it out of her hand like a tooth? I couldn't help trying to guess. Tell me what those English witches do, Grandmama, I said. Well, she said, sucking away at her stinking cigar. Their favourite ruse is to mix up a powder that will turn a child into some creature or other that all grown-ups hate. What sort of a creature, Grandmama? Often, it's a slug, she said. A slug is one of their favourites. Then the grown-ups step on the slug and squish it without knowing it's a child. That's perfectly beastly, I cried. Or it might be a flea, my grandmother said. They might turn you into a flea, and without realising what she was doing, your own mother would get out the flea powder, and then it's good by you. You're making me nervous, Grandmama. I don't think I want to go back to England. I've known English witches she went on, who have turned children into pheasants and then sneak the pheasants up into the woods the very day before the pheasant shooting season opened. Ouch, I said. So they get shot? Of course they get shot, she said. And then they get plucked and roasted and eaten for supper. I pictured myself as a pheasant flying frantically over the men with the guns, swerving and dipping as the guns exploded below me. Yes, my grandmother said. It gives the English witches great pleasure to stand back and watch the grown-ups doing away with their own children. I really don't want to go to England, Grandmama. Of course you don't she said. Nor do I, but I'm afraid we've got to. Are witches different in every country? I asked. Completely different, my grandmother said, but I don't know much about the other countries. Don't you even know about America? I asked. Not really, she answered, although I have heard it said that over there the witches are able to make the grown-ups eat their own children. Never, I cried. Oh no, Grandmama, that couldn't be true. I don't know whether it's true or not, she said. It's only a rumour I've heard. Slug?
roasted pheasant. Poor, poor children. But how could they possibly make them eat their own children? I asked. By turning them into hot dogs, she said. That wouldn't be too difficult for a clever witch. Does every single country in the world have its witches? I asked. Wherever you find people, you find witches, my grandmother said. There is a secret society of witches in every country. And do they all know one another, Grandmama? They do not, she said. A witch only knows the witches in her own country. She is strictly forbidden to communicate with any foreign witches. But an English witch, for example, will know all the other witches in England. They are all friends. They ring each other up. They swap deadly recipes. Goodness knows what else they talk about. I hate to think. I sat on the floor, watching my grandmother. She put her cigar stub in the ashtray and folded her hands across her stomach. Once a year, she went on, the witches of each separate country hold their own secret meeting. They all get together in one place to receive a lecture from the Grand High Witch of all the world. From who? I cried. She is the ruler of them all, my grandmother said. She is all-powerful. She is without mercy. All other witches are petrified of her. They see her only once a year at their annual meeting. She goes there to whip up excitement and enthusiasm and to give orders. The Grand High Witch travels from country to country attending these annual meetings. Where do they have these meetings, Grandmama? There are all sorts of rumours, my grandmother answered. I have heard it said that they just book into a hotel like any other group of women are holding a meeting. I have also heard it said that some very peculiar things go on in the hotels they stay in. It is rumoured that the beds are never slept in, that there are burn marks on the bedroom carpets, that toads are discovered in the bathtubs, and that down in the kitchen the cook once found a baby crocodile swimming in his saucepan of soup. Just like that. Is that a child turned into a crocodile? Ready for eating? My grandmother picked up her cigar and took another puff, inhaling the foul smoke deeply into her lungs. Where does the Grand High Witch live when she's at home? I asked. Nobody knows, my grandmother said. If we knew that, then she could be rooted out and destroyed. Witcherfiles all over the world have spent their lives trying to discover the secret headquarters of the Grand High Witch. What is a witchophile, Grandmama? A person who studies witches and knows a lot about them, my grandmother said. Are you a witcherphile, Grandmama? I am a retired witcherphile, she said. I am too old to be active any longer. But when I was younger, I travelled all over the globe trying to track down the Grand High Witch. I never came even close to succeeding. 
Is she which? I asked. She's rolling, my grandmother said. Simply rolling in money. Rumour has it that there is a machine in her headquarters which is exactly like the machine the government uses to print the banknotes you and I use. After all, banknotes are only bits of paper with special designs and pictures on them. Anyone can make them who has the right machine and the right paper. My guess is that the Grand High Witch makes all the money she wants and she dishes it out to witches everywhere. What about foreign money? I asked. Those machines can make Chinese money if you want them to, my grandmother said. It's only a question of pressing the right button. But, Grandmama, I said, if nobody has ever seen the Grand High Witch, how can you be so sure she exists? My grandmother gave me a long and very severe look. Nobody has ever seen the devil, she said, but we know he exists. The next morning, we sailed for England, and soon I was back in the old family house in Kent, but this time with only my grandmother to look after me. Then the Easter term began, and every weekday I went to school and everything seemed to have come back to normal again. Now, at the bottom of our garden, there was an enormous conker tree, and high up in its branches... Timmy, my best friend, and I had started to build a magnificent tree house. We were able to work on it only at the weekends, but we were getting along fine. We had begun with the floor, which was built by laying wide planks between two quite far apart branches and nailing them down. Within a month, we had finished the floor. Then we constructed a wooden railing around the floor that left only the roof to be built. The roof was the difficult bit. One Saturday afternoon, when Timmy was in bed with flu, I decided to make a start on the roof all by myself. It was lovely being high up there in that conker tree, all alone with the pale young leaves coming out everywhere around me. It was like being in a big green cave, and the height made it extra exciting. My grandmother had told me that I... Sorry. My grandmother had told me that if I fell, I would break a leg, and every time I looked down, I got a tingle along my spine. I worked away, nailing the first plank on the roof. Then suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a woman standing immediately below me. She was looking up at me and smiling in a most peculiar way. When most people smile, their lips go out sideways. This woman's lips went upwards and downwards, showing all her front teeth and gums. The gums were like raw meat. It is always a shock to discover that you are being watched when you think you are alone. And what was this strange woman doing in our garden, anyway? I noticed that she was wearing a small black hat and she had black gloves on her hands, and the gloves came nearly up to her elbows. Gloves. She was wearing gloves. I froze all over. I have a present for you, she said, still staring at me, still smiling, still showing her teeth and gums. I didn't answer. Come down out of that tree, little boy, she said, and I shall give you the most exciting present you've ever had. Her voice had a 
curious rasping quality. It made a sort of metallic sound, as though her throat was full of drawing pins. Here's the tree house under construction. Without taking her eyes from my face, she was very slowly, she very slowly put one of those gloved hands into her purse and drew out a small green snake. She held it up for me to see. It's tame, she said. The snake began to coil itself around her forearm. It was brilliant green. If you come down here, I shall give him to you, she said. Oh, Grandmama, I thought, come and help me. Then I panicked. I dropped the hammer and shot up that enormous tree like a monkey. I didn't stop until I was as high as I could possibly go, and there I stayed, quivering with fear. I couldn't see the woman now. There were layers and layers of leaves between her and me. I stayed up there for hours, and I kept very still. It began to grow dark. At last... I heard my grandmother calling my name. I'm up here, I shouted back. Come down at once, she called out. It's past your supper time. Grandmama, I shouted. Has that woman gone? What woman? My grandmother called back. The woman in the black gloves. There was silence from below. It was the silence of somebody who was too stunned to speak. Grandmama, I shouted again. Has she gone? Yes, my grandmother answered at last. She's gone. I'm here, my darling. I'll look after you. You can come down now. I climbed down. I was trembling. My grandmother enfolded me in her arms. I've seen a witch. I said. Come inside, she said. You'll be all right with me. She led me into the house and gave me a cup of hot cocoa with lots of sugar in it. Tell me everything, she said. I told her. By the time I had finished, it was my grandmother who was trembling. Her face was ashy grey, and I saw her glance down at that hand of hers that didn't have a thumb. You know what this means, she said. It means that there is one of them in our district. From now on, I'm not letting you walk alone to school. Do you think she could be after me specially? I asked. No, she said. I doubt that. One child is as good as any other to those creatures. It is hardly surprising that after that I became a very witch-conscious little boy. If I happened to be alone on the road and saw a woman approaching who was wearing gloves, I would quickly skip across to the other side. 
and as the weather remained pretty cold during the whole of that month, nearly everybody was wearing gloves. Curiously enough, though, I never saw the woman with the green snake again. That was my first witch, but it wasn't my last. Here's the poor little boy in the tree. And the suspected witch with the snake. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you for listening, Fox fans. That was chapter four of Roald Dahl's The Witches. Really hope you enjoyed it, everybody. It's a fun little book. Not the most politically correct of children's books, but a lovely one, nonetheless. Ugh. And how are we all doing? Sorry for just one or two little errors here and there. Sometimes it's easy to get just a little bit distracted by things and you can just lose your place for a second. Oh wait, no, it'll be, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm losing, losing my marbles. There we go. All right. <laughs> oh, you noticed that, Olivia. All right. All right. All right. All right. Settle down there. Come on, stop fighting. You know, I ain't got time for all that nonsense. We've got animals to feed. We've got creatures to look after. Don't be making fun of each other. It's not nice. Okay. So. Yeah, this is chapter five of Roald Dahl's The Witches. Try not to block my face completely with the book. <laughs> Summer Holidays The Easter holidays came and went, and the summer term began at school. My grandmother and I had already planned to take our summer holiday in Norway, and we talked about almost nothing else every evening. She had booked a cabin for each of us on the boat from Newcastle to Oslo at the earliest possible moment after my school broke up, and from Oslo she was going to take me to a place she knew down on the south coast, near Arendal, where she had spent her own summer holidays as a child nearly 80 years ago. All day long, she said, my brother and I were out in the rowing boat. The whole coast is dotted with tiny islands and there's nobody on them. We used to explore them and dive into the sea off the lovely smooth granite rocks, and sometimes on the way out we would drop the anchor and fish for cod and whiting, and if we caught anything, we would build a fire on an island and fry the fish in a pan for our lunch. There is no finer fish in the world than absolutely fresh cod. What did you use for bait, Grandmama, when you went fishing? 
Muscles, she said. Everyone uses mussels for bait in Norway, and if we didn't catch any fish, we would boil the mussels in a saucepan and eat those. Were they good? Delicious, she said. Cook them in seawater and they are tender and salty. What else did you do, Grandmama? We used to row out and wave to the shrimp boats on their way home and they would stop and give us a handful of shrimps each. The shrimps were still warm from having been just cooked, and we would sit in the rowing boat, peeling them and gobbling them up. The head was the best part. The head? I said. You squeeze the head between your teeth and suck out the inside. It's marvellous. You and I will do all those things this summer, my darling. She said. Grandmamma, I said. I can't wait. I simply can't wait to go. Nor can I, she said. When there were only three weeks of the summer term left, an awful thing happened. My grandmother got pneumonia. She became very ill and a trained nurse moved into the house to look after her. The doctor explained to me that pneumonia is not normally a dangerous illness nowadays because of penicillin, but when a person is more than 80 years old, as my grandmother was, then it is very dangerous indeed. He said he didn't even dare to move her to hospital in her condition, so she stayed in her bedroom and I hung about outside the door while oxygen cylinders and all sorts of other frightening things were taken into her. Can I go in and see her? I asked. No, dear, the nurse said. Not at the moment. A fat and jolly lady called Mrs Spring, who used to come and clean our house every day, also moved in and slept in the house. Mrs. Spring looked after me and cooked my meals. I liked her very much, but she wasn't a patch on my grandmother for telling stories. One evening, about ten days later, the doctor came downstairs and said to me, You can go in and see her now, but only for a short time. She's been asking for you. I flew up the stairs and burst into my grandmother's room and threw myself into her arms. Here there, the nurse said. Be careful with her. Will you be all right now, Grandmama? I asked. The worst is over, she said. I'll soon be up again. Will she? I said to the nurse. Oh, yes, the nurse answered, smiling. She told us she simply had to get better because she had to look after you. I gave her another hug. They won't let me have a cigar, she said. But you wait till they've gone. She's a tough old bird, the nurse said. We'll have her up in another week. The nurse was right. Within a week, my grandmother was thumping around the house with her gold-topped cane and interfering with Mrs. Spring's cooking. I thank you for all your help, Mrs. Spring, she said, but you can go home now. Oh, no, I can't, Mrs. Spring said. Doctor told me to see that you take it very easy for the next few days. The doctor said more than that. He dropped a bombshell on my grandmother and me by telling us that on no account were we to risk the journey to Norway this summer. Rubbish, my grandmother cried. I've promised him we'll go. It's too far, the doctor said. It would be very dangerous, but I'll tell you what you can't do. You can take your grandson to a nice hotel on the south coast of England instead. 
The sea air is just what you need. Oh no, I said. Do you want your grandmother to die? The doctor asked me. Never, I said. Then don't let her go on a long journey this summer. She's not yet strong enough. And don't stop her... Oh, sorry about that. And stop her smoking those vile black cigars. In the end, the doctor had his way about the holiday. But not about the cigars. Rooms were booked for us in a place called the Hotel Magnificent, in the famous seaside town of Bournemouth. Bournemouth, my grandmother told me, was full of old people like herself. They retired there by the thousand, because the air was so bracing and healthy it kept them, so they believed, alive for a few extra years. Does it? I asked. Of course not, she said. It's Tommy Rot. But just for once, I think we've got to obey the doctor. Soon after that, my grandmother and I took the train to Bournemouth and settled into the Hotel Magnificent. It was an enormous white building on the seafront, and it looked to me like a pretty boring place to spend a summer holiday in. I had my own separate bedroom, but there was a door connecting my room with my grandmother's room so that we could visit each other without going into the corridor. Just before we left for Bournemouth, my grandmother had given me, as consolation, a present of two white mice in a little cage, and of course I took them with me. They were terrific fun, those mice. I called them William and Mary, and in the hotel I set out right away teaching them to do tricks. The first trick I taught them was to creep up the sleeve of my jacket and to come out by my neck. Then I taught them to climb up the back of my neck onto the top of my head. I did this by putting cake crumbs in my hair. On the very first morning after our arrival, the chambermaid was making my bed when one of my mice poked its head out from under the sheets. The maid let out a shriek that brought a dozen people running to see who was being murdered. I was reported to the manager. There followed an unpleasant scene in the manager's office, with the manager, my grandmother, and me. The manager, whose name was Mr. Stringer, was a bristly man in a black tailcoat. I cannot permit mice in my hotel, madam, he said to my grandmother. How dare you say that when your rotten hotel is full of rats anyway, my grandmother cried. Rats, said Mr. Stringer, going mauve in the face. There are no rats in this hotel. I saw one this very morning, my grandmother said. It was running down the corridor into the kitchen. That is not true, cried Mr. Stringer. You had better get the rat catcher in at once, my grandmother said, before I report you to the public health authorities. I expect there's rats scuttling all over the kitchen floor and stealing the food off the shelves and jumping in and out of the soup. Never, cried Mr. Stringer. No wonder my breakfast toast was all nibbled round the edges this morning, my grandmother went on relentlessly. No wonder it had a nasty, ratty taste. If you're not careful, the health people will be ordering the entire hotel to be closed before everyone gets typhoid fever. You are not being serious, madam, Mr. Stringer said. I was never more serious in my life, my grandmother said. Are you, or are you not, going to allow my grandson to keep his white mice in his room? The manager knew when he was beaten. "'May I suggest a compromise, madam?' he said. 
I will permit him to keep them in his room as long as they are never allowed out of the cage. How's that? That will suit us very well, my grandmother said, and she stood up and marched out of the room with me behind her. There is no way you can train mice inside a cage. Yet I dared not let them out because the chambermaid was spying on me all the time. She told me that the first mouse to break the rule would be an empty room in this enormous hotel. I put one mouse into each trouser, all of them named in gold letters on the doors. I wandered through the lounge and the smoking room and the card room and the reading room and the drawing room. None of them was empty. I went down a long, wide corridor, and at the end of it, I came to the ballroom. There were double doors leading into it, and in front of the doors there was a large notice board on a stand. The notice on the board said, RSPCC meeting. Strictly private. This room is reserved for the annual meeting of the Royal Society for the prevention of cruelty to children. The double doors into the room were open. I peeped in. It was a colossal room. There were rows and rows of chairs, all facing a platform. The chairs were painted gold, and they had little red cushions on the seats. But there was not a soul in sight. I sidled cautiously into the room. What a lovely, secret, silent place it was. The meeting of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children must have taken place earlier in the day, and now they had all gone home. Even if they hadn't, even if they did suddenly come pouring in, they would be wonderful, kind people who would look with favour upon a young mouse trainer going about his business. At the back of the room there was a large folding screen with Chinese dragons painted on it. I decided, just to be on the safe side, to go behind this screen and do my training there. I wasn't a bit frightened of the prevention of cruelty to the children, people, but there was always a chance that Mr Stringer, the manager, might pop his head round the door. If he did, and if he saw the mice... The poor things would be in the hall porter's bucket of water before I could shout stop. I tiptoed to the back of the room and settled myself on the thick green carpet behind the big screen. What a splendid place this was. Ideal for mouse training. I took William and Mary out of my trouser pockets. They sat beside me on the carpet quiet and well-behaved. The trick I was going to teach them today was tightrope walking. It is not all that difficult to train an intelligent mouse to be an expert tightrope walker, provided you know exactly how to go about it. First, you must have a piece of string. I had that. Then you must have some good cake. A fine currant cake is the favourite food of white mice. They are dotty about it. I had brought with me a rock cake which I had pocketed while having tea with Grandmama the day before. Now, here's what you do. You stretch the string tight between your two hands, but you start by keeping it very short, only about three inches. You put the mouse on your right hand and a little piece of cake on your left hand. The mouse is therefore only three inches away from the cake. He can see it and he can smell it. His whiskers twitch with excitement. He can almost reach the cake by leaning forward, but not quite. He only has to take two steps along the string to reach this tasty morsel. He ventures forward, 
one paw on the string, then the other. If the mouse has a good sense of balance, and most of them have, he will get across easily. I started with William. He walked the string without a moment's hesitation. I let him have a quick nibble of the cake, just to whet his appetite. Then I put him back on my right hand. This time I lengthened the string. I made it about six inches long. William knew what to do now. With superb balance, he walked step by step along the string until he reached the cake. He was rewarded with another nibble. Quite soon, William was walking a 24-inch tightrope, or rather, tight string, from one hand to the other to reach the cake. It was wonderful to watch him. He was enjoying himself tremendously. I was careful to hold the string near the carpet so that if he did lose his balance, he wouldn't have far to fall. But he never fell. William was obviously a natural acrobat. A great, tight, rope-walking mouse. Now it was Mary's turn. I put William on the carpet beside me and rewarded him with some extra crumbs in a current. Then I started going through the same routine all over again with Mary. My blinding ambition, you see, my dream of dreams, was to become one day the owner of a white mouse circus. I would have a small stage with red curtains in front of it, and when the curtains were drawn apart, the audience would see my world-famous performing mice walking on tight ropes Swimming from tra- swinging from trapezes, turning somersaults in the air, bouncing on trampolines and all the rest of it. I would have white mice riding on white rats, and the rats would gallop furiously round and round the stage. I was beginning to picture myself travelling first class all over the globe with my famous white mouse circus and performing before all the crowned heads of Europe. I was about halfway through Mary's training, when suddenly I heard voices outside the ballroom door. The sound grew louder. It swelled into a great babble of speech from many throats. I recognised the voice of the awful hotel manager, Mr. Stringer. Help, I thought. But thank heavens for the huge screen. I crouched behind it and peered through the crack between two of the folding sections. I could see the entire length and width of the ballroom without anyone seeing me. Well, ladies... I'm sure you'll be quite comfortable in here, Mr. Stringer's voice was saying. Then in through the double doors he marched, black tailcoat and all, spreading his arms wide as he ushered in a great flock of ladies. If there is anything we can do for you, do not hesitate to let me know, he went on. Tea will be served for all of you on the Sunshine Terrace after you have concluded your meeting. With that, he bowed and scraped himself out of the room as a vast herd of ladies from the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children came streaming in. They wore pretty clothes, and all of them had hats on their heads. So, that's the end of chapter five. Let's have a little recap of the pictures. I nearly started showing a couple of pictures at one point, and I thought, no, I'll just keep the momentum of the chapter. And yeah, you notice me correcting myself in the character voice of the Doctor. I w- honestly, I wasn't trying to like cover it up. It was just natural, and it felt more amusing to 
have him apologize to you than me apologize to and then go back to the voice again um here's the grand mama and the little boy very pleased to see her she's still a little bit weak and frail there but she's getting better and the nurse doing a fine job And then we have the boy training the mice. Good times. The early days of his white mouse circus. And here is Mr. Stringer. <laughs> he didn't he didn't have a West Country accent, it's just I think that's the same name as a character in the British movie Hot Fuzz. The second in the Cornetto trilogy, it's called, with Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, directed by Edgar Wright. I think he's Mr. Stringer. And it's set in the West Country, you see. It's um, That character's played by Timothy Dalton. And he speaks rather fine English, of course. It's Timothy Dalton. He used to be James Bond back in the day. But um, the rest of them have got a mix. And there's quite a lot with very broad West Country accents. Uh, and then we've got the ballroom doors here. With a little sign. And the boy curiously peeping in, thinking he's found the most perfect place for mice training you see most ideal and then the beginning of the tightrope training he's a natural born master of the art this boy he knows exactly what to do and with such confidence as well you know when he's telling this story later in life it's not difficult to train mice as long as you know what you're doing and he knows what he's doing. He already knows their favourite food of currant cake and just a few inches at a time. He sort of tricks the mice into walking the tightrope. I'm sure they're having a great time as well. Glad you're enjoying it, Fox fans. Glad you're enjoying it. Okay. On to what is technically chapter six. The meeting. Now that the manager had gone, I was not particularly alarmed. What better than to be imprisoned in a room full of these splendid ladies? If I ever got talking to them, I might even suggest that they come and do a bit of cruelty to children preventing at my school. We could certainly use them there. In they came, talking their heads off. They began milling round and choosing their seats, and there was a whole lot of stuff like, Come and sit next to me, Millie dear, and... Oh, hello, Beatrice. I haven't seen you since the last meeting. What an adorable dress you have on. I decided to stay where I was and let them get on with their meeting while I got on with my mouse training. But I watched them for a while longer through the crack in the screen, waiting for them to settle down. How many were there? I guessed about two hundred. The back rows filled up first. They all seemed to want to sit as far back from the platform as possible. There was a lady wearing a tiny green hat in the middle of the back row who kept scratching the nape of her neck. She couldn't leave it alone. It fascinated me the way her fingers kept scratching away at the hair on the back of her neck. Had she known somebody was watching her from behind, I'm sure she would have been embarrassed. I wondered if she had dandruff. All of a sudden, 
I noticed that the lady next to her was doing the same thing. And the next one. And the next. The whole lot of them were doing it. They were all scratching away like mad at the hair on the backs of their necks. Did they have fleas in their hair? Most likely it was nits. A boy at school called Ashton had had nits in his hair last term and the matron had made him dip his whole head in turpentine. It killed the nits all right, but it nearly killed Ashton as well. Half the skin came away from his scalp. I began to be fascinated by these hair-scratching ladies. It is always funny when you catch someone doing something coarse and she thinks no one is looking. Nose-picking, for example, or scratching her bottom. Hair-scratching is very nearly as unattractive, especially if it goes on and on. I decided it had to be nits. Then, the most astonishing thing happened. I saw one lady pushing her fingers up underneath the hair on her head, and the hair, the entire head of hair, lifted upwards all in one piece, and the hand slid underneath the hair and went on scratching. She was wearing a wig. She was also wearing gloves. I glanced swiftly around at the rest of the now seated audience. Every one of them was wearing gloves. My blood turned to ice. I began to shake all over. I glanced frantically behind me for a back door to escape through. There wasn't one. Should I leap out from behind the screen and make a dash for the double doors? Those double doors were already closed, and I could see a woman standing in front of them. She was bending forward and fixing some sort of a metal chain round the two door handles. Keep still, I told myself. No one has seen you yet. There's no reason in the world why they should come and look behind the screen. But one false move, one cough, one sneeze, one nose blow, one little sound of any sort. And it won't be just one witch that gets you. It'll be two hundred. At that point, I think I fainted. The whole thing was altogether too much for a small boy to cope with. But I don't believe I was out for more than a few seconds. And when I came to, I was lying on the carpet, and I was still, thank heavens, behind the screen. There was absolute silence all around me. Rather shakily, I got to my knees and peered once again through the crack in the screen. What does he see? Oh, goodness. It doesn't look good. Here are the ladies taking their seats. And one by one, yes, he notices. What is happening? Whew. Intense. Intense stuff. As we finish another chapter. Uh, it was good fun. Excuse me. Good fun, I think.
I saw Freewheeling Skeptic popping in. And like Mango said, breaking the news hard. You have missed quite a lot. Um, there was some randomness for quite a long time in the middle there as well. I was just reading some extracts from Lord of the Rings and sort of singing a couple of the songs uh, and just chatting a little bit. There was um, a little bit of mischief among the the Fox fans throwing spells around and stuff, you know, standard stuff, really standard stuff. Um, and we kicked off the stream after just a short chat with chapter 12 of To Marry a Prince. That was a good one. That was a good one. Um, yeah, it's a good one. I see um, Odessina saying that you love this book. The Witches is a wonderful one. I'm a big fan of all the Roald Dahl books, I must say. Childhood favourites and still favourites as an adult as well. They're fantastic. Uh, that's a good point, Lynette. You saw an interview with Roald Dahl saying that they've got to be funny. <laughs> yeah, or the, the kids are just going to get bored, aren't they? They're going to go do something else. And, I mean, no time than ever has that been appropriate. Um, you know, with so many other distractions these days. So much never-ending TV to stream, video games to play, and all the rest of it. So, they need to be good. Oh, that's interesting, Lynette. He mentioned Secret Garden, did he, by name? It is a fantastic one. It really, really is. And it's become very dear to my to my heart now after narrating that over all those weeks. A couple of years ago, finishing it off um, just over a year ago now, I think I finished that. Um, with those raw reading videos as it was originally presented and then I cut it all up and uh, stuck it together for the complete version. Chapter 7 This is where we left the boy peeking through the screen. All the women or rather, the witches, were now sitting motionless in their chairs and staring as though hypnotised at somebody who had suddenly appeared on the platform. That somebody was another woman. The first thing I noticed about this woman was her size. She was tiny probably no more than four and a half feet tall. She looked quite young, I guessed about twenty-five or six, and she was very pretty. She had on a rather stylish long black dress that reached right to the ground, and she wore black gloves that came up to her elbows. Unlike the others, she wasn't wearing a hat. She didn't look to me like a witch at all, but she couldn't possibly not be one. Otherwise, what on earth was she doing up there on the platform? And why, for heaven's sake, were all the other witches gazing at her with such a mixture of adoration, awe, and fear? Very slowly, Trying to quickly show you the lady. The young lady on the platform raised her hands to her face. I saw her gloved fingers unhooking something behind her ears, and then, then, she caught hold of her cheeks and lifted her face clean away. The whole of that pretty face came away in her hands. It was a mask. 
As she took off the mask, she turned sideways and placed it carefully upon a small table nearby. And when she turned round again and faced us, I very nearly screamed out loud. That face of hers was the most frightful and frightening thing I have ever seen. Just looking at it gave me the shakes all over. It was so crumpled and wizened, so shrunken and shriveled, it looked as though it had been pickled in vinegar. It was a fearsome and ghastly sight. There was something terribly wrong with it, something foul and putrid and decayed. It seemed quite literally to be rotting away at the edges, and in the middle of the face, around the mouth and cheeks, I could see the skin all cankered and worm-eaten, as though maggots were working away in there. There are times when something is so frightful you become mesmerised by it and can't look away. I was like that now. I was transfixed. I was numbed. I was magnetised by the sheer horror of this woman's features. But there was more to it than that. There was a look of serpents in those eyes of hers as they flashed around the audience. I knew immediately, of course, that this was none other than the Grand High Witch herself. I knew also why she had worn a mask. She could never have moved around in public, let alone book in at a hotel with her real face. Everyone who saw her would have run away screaming. There she is. Ghastly. The doors! shouted the Grand High Witch in a voice that filled the room and bounced around the walls. Are they chained and bolted? The doors are chained and bolted, your grandness, answered a voice in the audience. The brilliant snake's eyes that were set so deep in that dreadful, rotting, worm-eaten face glared unblinkingly at the witches who sat facing her. You may remove your gloves, she shouted. Her voice, I noticed, had that same hard, metallic quality as the voice of the witch I'd met under the conquer tree, only it was far louder and much, much harsher. It rasped, it grated, it snarled, it scraped, it shrieked, and it growled. Everyone in the room was peeling off her gloves. I was watching the hands of those in the back row. I wanted very much to see what their fingers looked like and whether my grandmother had been right. Ah, yes. I could see several of them now. I could see the brown claws curving over the tips of the fingers. They were about two inches long, those claws, and sharp at the ends. You may remove your shoes, barked the Grand High Witch. I heard a sigh of relief going up from all the witches in the room as they kicked off their narrow, high-heeled shoes. And then I got a glimpse under the chairs of several pairs of stockinged feet, square 
and completely toeless. Revolting, they were, as though the toes had been sliced away from the feet with a carving knife. You may remove your vigs, snarled the Grand High Witch. She had a peculiar way of speaking. There was some sort of a foreign accent there. Something harsh and guttural, and she seemed to have trouble pronouncing the letter W. As well as that, she did something funny with the letter R. She would roll it round and round her mouth like a piece of hot pork crackling before spitting it out. Remove your wigs and get some fresh air into your spotty scalps, she shouted, and another sigh of relief arose from the audience as all the hands went up to their heads, and all the wigs, with their hats still on them, were lifted away. There now appeared in front of me row upon row of bald female heads, a sea of naked scalps, every one of them red and itchy looking from being rubbed by the lining of the wigs. I simply cannot tell you how awful they were, and somehow the whole sight was made more grotesque because underneath those frightful scabby bald heads the bodies were dressed in fashionable and rather pretty clothes. It was monstrous. It was unnatural. Oh, heavens, I thought. Oh, help. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. These foul all headed females are child killers, every one of them, and here I am imprisoned in the same room, and I can't escape. At that point, a new and doubly horrifying thought struck me. My grandmother had said that with their special nose holes, they could smell out a child on a pitch-black night from right across the other side of the road. Up to now, my grandmother had been right every time. It seemed a certainty, therefore, that one of the witches in the back row was going to sniff me out at any moment, and then the yell of, Dog's droppings! would go up all over the room, and I would be cornered like a rat. I knelt on the carpet behind the screen, hardly daring to breathe. Then suddenly, I remembered another very important thing my grandmother had told me. The dirtier you are, she had said, the harder it is for a witch to smell you out. How long since I had last had a bath? Not for ages. I had my own room in the hotel, and my grandmother never bothered with silly things like that. Come to think of it, I don't believe I'd had a bath since we arrived. When had I last washed my hands or face? Certainly not this morning. Not yesterday either. I glanced down at my hands. They were covered with smudge and mud and goodness knows what else besides. So perhaps I had a chance after all. The stink waves couldn't possibly get out through all that dirt. Witches of Inkland, shouted the Grand High Witch. She herself, I noticed, had not taken off either her wig, or her gloves, or her shoes. Witches of 
England! She yelled. The audience stirred uneasily and sat up straighter in their chairs. Miserable witches! She yelled. Useless, lazy witches! Feeble, fribbling witches! You are a heap of idle, good-for-nothing worms! A shudder went through the audience. The Grand High Witch was clearly in an ugly mood, and they knew it. I had a feeling that something awful was going to happen soon. I am having my breakfast this morning, cried the Grand High Witch, and I am looking out of the window at the beach, and what am I seeing? I am asking you, what am I seeing? I am seeing a revolt. Sight. I am seeing hundreds. I am seeing thousands of rotten, repulsive little children playing up on the sand. It is putting me right off my food. Why? Have you not got rid of them? She screamed. Why have you not rubbed them all out, these filthy, smelly children? With each word she spoke, flecks of pale blue phlegm shot from her mouth like bullets. I... I'm asking you why, she screamed. Nobody answered her question. Children, smell, she screamed. They stink out the world. We do not want these children around here. The bald heads in the audience all nodded vigorously. One child a week is no good to me, the Grand High Witch cried out. Is that the best you can do? We will do better, murmured the audience. We will do much better. Better is no good either shrieked the grand high witch i demand maximum results so here are my orders my orders are that every single child in this country shall be rubbed out squashed squirted squitted and fretted out before I come here again in one year's time. Do I make myself clear? A great gasp went up from the audience. I saw the witches all looking at one another with deeply troubled expressions. And I heard one witch at the end of the front row saying aloud, All of them! We can't possibly wipe out... All of them? The Grand High Witch whipped round as though someone had stuck a skewer into her bottom. Who said that? She snapped. Who dares to argue with me? It was you, was it not? 
She pointed a gloved finger as sharp as a needle at the witch who had spoken. I didn't mean it, your grandness, the witch cried out. I didn't mean to argue. I was just talking to myself. You dare to argue with me? screamed the Grand High Witch. I was just talking to myself, cried the wretched witch. I swear it, your grandness. She began to shake with fear. The Grand High Witch took a quick step forward, and when she spoke again, it was in a voice that made my blood run cold. Hey, stupid fish who answers back must burn until <gasps> bones are black, she screamed. No, no, begged the witch in the front row. The Grand High Witch went on. <gasps> A foolish witch without a brain must sizzle in the fiery flame. Save me, cried the wretched witch in the front row. The Grand High Witch took no notice of her. She spoke again. An idiotic wretch like you must roast upon the barbecue. Forgive me, oh, your grandness, cried the miserable culprit. I didn't mean it. But the Grand High Witch continued with her terrible recital. A witch who dares to say I'm wrong will not be with us very long. A moment later, a stream of sparks that looked like tiny white hot metal filings came shooting out of the Grand High Witch's eyes and flew straight towards the one who had dared to speak. I saw the spark striking against her and burrowing into her, and she screamed a horrible, howling scream, and a puff of smoke rose up around her. A smell of burning meat filled the room. Nobody moved. Like me, they were all watching the smoke. And when it had cleared away, the chair was empty. I caught a glimpse of something wispy white, like a little cloud fluttering upwards and disappearing out of the window. A great sigh rose up from the audience. The Grand High Witch glared around the room. I hope nobody else is going to make me cross today, she remarked. There was a deathly silence. Frizzled like a fritter, said the Grand High Witch. Cooked like a carrot. You will never see her again. Now, we can get down to business.
And that was the end of chapter seven. Trying to get this picture to focus, but it won't focus. But this is the sizzled witch. Nothing left but a puff of smoke. And here is the Grand High Witch casting her spell. She is a very unpleasant character, no? I would not like to mess with her. Good, Shannon, that's the whole point. There is nothing more scary than the Grand High Witch of all the world. Even Voldemort would not stand a chance against the might of the Grand High Witch. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to see you go too, Anki Anka. I saw you pop in just at the start of the reading, actually. I was reading the chat as I was reading the book. Or a little bit here and there, anyway. I saw the fear of Shannon. Teresa advising me to have a drink of water. And I saw Anki Anka popping in as well. Have a good day. Thanks very much. Thanks, Olivia. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure that the balancing on my microphone was absolutely awful there. Um, I'm sure that my screams and screeches were going way off the chat and uh, off the chart, sorry, and um, clipping, as we call it. So like kind of breaking the audio a little bit. Um, you know, like when I'm recording normally, I can adjust, adjust the volume or the pickup, like how much, um, how much sound the microphone brings in, uh, and distance myself a little bit better and be a bit more controlled and not scream so much and things like that. But I was just having fun with it and I thought you would enjoy it. So I'm sorry if it was tearing your eardrums out or if it was uh distorting a bit with the um with the microphone struggling to pick up that very loud volume <laughs> uh thanks very much anki anka and oh and thank you wolf thank you mama fox thanks logan really glad you're enjoying it peeps Oh, and hello to Lightweaver. Welcome to the stream. I've not seen you here before. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you. Okay. We've had some song time. So, moving on to chapter 8 of The Witches. Oh, don't you worry, Shannon. You just come back when you can. On a journey long without a word. That's a very sad little song as well, though. Bless Frodo. Missing him badly. Poor, poor, poor Gandalf. Uh, yeah, it's just my own melodies uh ju tang um there is a a recording of tolkien singing galadriel's second song in farewell to lorian uh chapter eight of book two um but yeah all the tunes are just my own creation so maria and i didn't use tolkien's uh tune he sings it 
uh, well you can check it out if you if you stick it into youtube i'm sure you'll be able to find it um but uh yeah people have asked me about where do i get the tunes from and it's a mix of influences you know sometimes i listen to some folk songs of different origins or um yeah just google about a little bit and sometimes just a little tune comes to my head and maybe it's got some influence from some uh children's nursery rhyme or a christmas song or who knows what you know what i mean it can be a mishmash of all sorts of different things uh, i'm gonna jump in to chapter eight of the witches that's the plan oh yeah there was a couple of other pictures that i missed as well there's the gloves coming off and the claw like hands beneath thank you camera for focusing appreciate that and then there's the what, 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 there's the very odd square toeless feet crushed into those pointy heels. Mm, I kind of briefly tried to show this as well whilst I was reading. She's a mess. From from this to this. Quite the contrast. So. Formula 86. Delayed action. Mouse maker. Children are revolting screamed the grand high witch we will wipe them all away we will scrub them off the face of the earth we will flush them down the drain yes yes chanted the audience Wipe them away! Scrub them off the earth! Flush them down the drain! Children are foul and filthy! Thundered the Grand High Witch. They are! They are! Chorused the English witches. They are foul and filthy! Children! are dirty and stinky screamed the grand high witch dirty and stinky dirty and stinky cried the audience getting more and more worked up children are smelling of dogs droppings Screech the Grand High Witch. Poo! cried the audience. Poo! 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 They are worse than dogs' droppings! Screech the Grand High Witch. Dogs' droppings is smelling like violets and primroses compared with children violets and primroses chanted the audience they were clapping and cheering almost every word spoken from the platform the speaker seemed to have them completely under her spell to talk about children is making me sick screamed the grand high witch i am feeling sick even thinking about them fetch me a basin the grand high witch paused and glared at the mass of eager faces in the audience they waited wanting more so now the grand high witch barked so now i am having a plan i 
am having a gigantic plan for getting rid of every single child in the whole of England. The witches gasped. They gaped. They turned and gave each other gowlish grins of excitement. Yes! thundered the Grand High Witch. We shall fish them and swallop them, and we shall make to disappear every single smelly little brat in England in one stroke. cried the witches, clapping their hands. You are brilliant! Oh, your grandness, you are fantabulous! Shut up and listen, snapped the Grand High Witch. Listen very carefully, and let us not be having any mock-ups. The audience leaned forward eager to learn how this magic was going to be performed. Each and every one of you, thundered the grand high witch, is to go back to your hometowns immediately and resign from your jobs. Resign. Give notice. Retire. We will, they cried. We will resign from our jobs. And after you have resigned from your jobs, the Grand High Witch went on, each and every one of you will be going out and will be buying. She paused. What will we be buying? They cried. Tell us, O brilliant one, what is it we shall be buying? Sweet shops! They cried. We are go- Oh, I see, sorry. Sweet shops! They cried. We are going to buy sweet shops. What a frumptious wheeze! Each of you will be buying for herself a sweet shop. You will be buying the very best and most respectable sweet shops in England. We will! We will! they answered. Their dreadful voices were like a chorus of dentists' drills all grinding away together. I am wanting no twopenny, halfpenny, crummy like tobacco selling newspaper sweet shops, shouted the Grand High Witch. I am wanting you to get only the very best shops, filled up high with piles and piles of luscious sweets and Tasty chocks. The best, they cried. We shall buy the best sweet shops in town. You will be having no trouble in getting what you want, shouted the Grand High Witch, because you will be offering four times as much as a shop is worth. And nobody is refusing an offer like that. Money is not a problem to us witches, as you know very well. I have brought with me six trunks stuffed full of English banknotes, all new and crisp. And all of them... She added with a fiendish leer. All of them homemade. 
The witches in the audience grinned, appreciating this joke. At that point, one foolish witch got so excited at the possibilities presented by owning a sweet shop that she leapt to her feet and shouted, The children will come flocking to my shop and I will feed them poison sweets and poison chocks and, and wipe them all out like weasels. The room became suddenly silent. I saw the tiny body of the Grand High Witch stiffen, and then go rigid with rage. Who spoke? She shrieked. It was you! You over there! The culprit sat down fast and covered her face with her clawed hands. You blithering bumpkin! screeched the Grand High Witch. You brainless bog vumper! Are you not realizing that if you are going round poisoning little children, you will be caught in five minutes flat? Never in my life am I hearing such a bosh, volloping suggestion coming from a witch. The entire audience cowered and shook. I'm quite sure they all thought, as I did, that the terrible white-hot sparks were about to start flying again. Curiously enough, they didn't. If such a tom-fiddling idea is all you can be coming up with, thundered the Grand High Witch. Then it is no wonder Inkland is still swarming with rotten little children. There was another silence. The Grand High Witch glared at the witches in the audience. Do you not know, she shouted at them, that we witches are working only with magic? We know, your grandness, they all answered. Of course we know. The Grand High Witch grated her bony gloved hands against each other and cried out, So, each of you is owning a magnificent sweet shop. The next move is that each of you will be announcing in the window of your shop that on a certain day, you will be having a great gala opening with free sweets and chocks to every child. Th that will bring them in, the greedy little brutes, cried the audience. They'll be fighting to get through the doors. Next, continued the Grand High Witch, you will prepare yourselves for this great gala opening by filling every chock and every sweet in your shop with my very latest and greatest magic formula. This is known as Formula 86 Delayed Action Mouse Maker. Delayed Action Mouse Maker, they chanted. She's done it again. Her grandness has concocted yet another of her wondrous magic child killers. How do we make it, oh brilliant one? Exercise patience, answered the Grand High Witch. First, I am explaining to you how my Formula 86 Delayed Action Mouse Maker is working. Listen carefully. We are listening, cried the audience who were now jumping up and down in their chairs with excitement. 
Delayed Action Mouse Maker is a green liquid, explained the Grand High Witch, and one droplet in each chalk or sweet will be quite enough. So here is what happens. Child eats chalk which has, has in it delayed action mouse maker liquid. Child goes home feeling fine. Child goes to bed still feeling fine. Child wakes up in the morning still feeling okay. Child goes to school still feeling fine. Formula, you understand, is delayed action and is not working yet. We understand, oh brainy one, cried the audience, but when does it start working? It is starting to work at exactly nine o'clock when the child is arriving at school shouted the Grand High Witch triumphantly. Child arrives at school. Delayed action mouse maker immediately starts to work. Child starts to shrink. Child is starting to grow fur. Child is starting to grow tail. All is happening in precisely... Twenty-six seconds. After twenty-six seconds, child is not a child any longer. It is a mouse. A mouse, cried the witches. What a frumptious thought. Classrooms will all be swarming with mice shouted the Grand High Witch. Chaos and pandemonium will be raining in every school in England. Teachers will be hopping up and down. Women teachers will be standing on desks and holding up skirts and yelling, Help! 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 They will! They will! cried the audience. And what? shouted the Grand High Witch. Is happening... Next in every school. Tell us, they cried. Tell us, oh brainy one. The Grand High Witch stretched her stringy neck forward and grinned at the audience, showing two rows of pointed teeth, slightly blue. She raised her voice louder than ever and shouted, Mouse Traps is coming out! Mouse Traps! cried the witches. And cheese! shouted the Grand High Witch. Teachers is all rushing and running out and getting mouse traps and baiting them with cheese and putting them down all over the school. Mice is nibbling cheese. Mouse traps is going off. All over school, mouse traps is going snappity snap. And mouse heads is rolling across the floors like marble. All over England, in every school in England, noise of snapping mouse traps will be heard. At this point, the disgusting old Grand High Witch began to do a sort of witch's dance up and down the platform stamping her feet and clapping her hands. The entire audience joined in the clapping and the foot stamping. 
They were making such a tremendous racket that I thought surely Mr. Stringer would hear it and come banging at the door. But he didn't. Then, above all the noise, I heard the voice of the Grand High Witch screaming out some sort of an awful gloating song. Down with children, do them in, boil their bones and fry their skin. Bish them, squish them, bash them, mash them, break them, shake them, slash them, smash them. Offer chocks with magic powder, say eat up, then say it louder. Cram them full of sticky eats, send them home still guzzling sweets, and in the morning lick. Little fools go marching off to separate schools. A girl feels sick and goes all pale. She yells, hey, look, I've grown a tail. A boy who's standing next to her screams, help, I think I'm growing fur. Another shouts, we looks like freaks. There's whiskers growing on every cheeks. A boy who was extremely tall cries out, What's wrong? I'm growing small. Four tiny legs begin to sprout from everybody round about. And all at once, all in a trice. They are no children, only mice. In every school is mice galore, all running round the schoolroom floor. And all the poor demented teachers is yelling, who are these creatures? They stand upon the desks and shout, Get out, you filthy mice, get out! Will someone fetch some mouse traps, please? And don't forget to bring the cheese! Now mouse traps come, and every trap goes snippity snip and snappy snap. The mouse traps have a powerful spring, the springs go crack and snap and ping. Is lovely noise for us to hear, is music to a witch's ear. Dead mice is every place around, piled two feet deep upon the ground. With teachers searching left and right, but not a single child in sight. The teachers cry, what's going on? Oh, where have all the children gone? Is half past nine, and as a rule, they're never late as this for school. Poor teachers don't know what to do. Some sit and read, and just a few amuse themselves throughout the day by sweeping all the mice away. And all us witches shout hooray! It was the best, oh, Grand High Witch. What a lovely song. I'm sure she's been practicing that for years. Auditioning to all the finest publishers, music producers in all the land. She makes YouTube videos. Everybody tells her she's good. All the witches in the comment section say she's the best witch ever. But the music producers, they do not sign her. They strike her down. This is what happens. This is what you 
turn her into? She was probably a very nice lady once upon a time. But now... She is nasty. Very, very, very nasty. Nasty, stinking hobbitsels. Here's the teacher sweeping up the dead mice slash children. Oh dear. Oh dear, 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 dear. Not good. Not good at all, it seems. But what can one do? The Grand High Witch has unmasked herself, it seems. Rather a nasty chap, after all. Good. I dropped a book, but it doesn't matter. It's okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that very, very, very silly chapter eight of one of Roald Dahl's many, many wonderful books. Uh, yeah, it was made into a, a film. I honestly don't remember who features in it, though. You're mentioning Angelica Houston. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we got a bit of extra sing-song time there of a, of a, of a sort. <laughs> oh, dear. We had Sam's song. We had a little bit of Frodo's song. And then, that madness. It was absolutely crazy. I think Smeagol would like it very much. She's very nasty. In fact, too nasty for Smeagol. More... Gollum! Gollum! Gollum would like it very much. Thanks, peeps. It's good fun. It's very easy to get very, very carried away with Roald Dahl. It's hard to keep it soothing and relaxing. But we had a gentle reading of If Only They Could Talk, right? And we had some rather calm chat and a little bit of singing. So it's been a nice mixed bag and finish off with some... Well, madness. Oh, very, very much enjoyed, Lynette. Good to hear it. Oh, and welcome back to Barbara. Nice to see you. I'm sure your name sounds far more eloquent in Russian than my northern pronunciation of Barbara. But welcome. Very nice to see you again. Uh, no, I didn't, Jake. I saw that you'd mentioned that. Um, you'd sent me a message uh, on Facebook through the through the fan page. Um, and I've not just replied to you yet, but um, no, I haven't seen that that you were talking about with the Matterhorn. Oh, and hello to Claire. Welcome back, welcome back. Um, you've just missed the second half of 1984, Chapter 1. And some talk about licorice. Yeah, you've highlighted things pretty well there, Lynette. But let's crack on with the witches. And I am remembering all by myself, like a very responsible adult, to change the text up at the top. I'm sure you're very proud of me. I hope we're all doing well, wherever we are in the world. And this has been a fantastic story, I think. Maybe the most popular book on the Red Fox Book Club currently. Um, I know there's quite a lot of you enjoying Tamari Prince as well, and James Harrier, and the other things that we've started 
Um, but I think The Witches has been the most popular so far. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Somehow we are back on the licorice debate, apparently. I'm staying out of things now. I've said what I need to say about the superior nature of black licorice. Um, and we're, we're just moving on. We're just moving on now. Feels like quite a relevant chapter name, though, this next one. It's called The Recipe. Oh, Joes, don't, don't you start. Australians haven't got a clue. Australians, don't ask them about good sweets. They don't have a clue. Let's see how many people I can trigger. Okay, so let's head back to Roldal's The Witches. The recipe. I hope you haven't forgotten that while all this was going on, I was still stuck behind the screen on my hands and knees with one eye glued to the track to the crack. I don't know how long I had been there, but it seemed like forever. The worst part of it was not being allowed to cough or make a sound, and knowing that if I did, I was as good as dead. And all the way through, I was living in constant terror that one of the witches in the back row was going to get a whiff of my presence through those special nose holes of hers. My only hope, as I saw it, was the fact that I hadn't washed for days. That and the never-ending excitement and clapping and shouting that was going on in the room. The witches were thinking of nothing except the Grand High Witch up there on the platform and her great plan for wiping out all the children of England. They certainly weren't sniffing around for a child in the room. In their wildest dreams, if witches have dreams, that would never have occurred to any of them. I kept still and prayed. The Grand High Witch's dreadful gloating song was over now, and the audience was clapping madly and shouting, Brilliant! Sensational! Marvellous! You're a genius, oh brainy one. It is a thrilling invention, this delayed action mouse maker. It is a winner. And the beauty of it is that the teachers will be the ones who bump off the stinking little children. It won't be us doing it. We shall never be caught. Witches are never caught snapped the Grand High Witch. Attention now. I want everybody's attention, for I am about to be telling you what you must do to prepare Formula 86 Delayed Action Mouse Maker. Suddenly there came a great gasp from the audience. This was followed by a hubbub of shrieking and yelling, and I saw many of the witches leaping to their feet and pointing at the platform and crying out, Mice! 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 She, she's done it to show us! The brainy one has turned two children into mice and there they are! I looked towards the platform. The mice were there all right, two of them running around near the Grand High Witch's skirts. But these were not field mice, or house mice, or wood mice, or harvest mice. They were white mice. I recognised them immediately as being my own little William and Mary. Mice! shouted the audience. Our leader has made mice to appear out of nowhere. Get the mouse traps! 
fetch the cheese. I saw the Grand High Witch peering down at the floor and staring with an obvious puzzlement at William and Mary. She bent lower to get a closer look. Then she straightened up and shouted, Quiet! The audience became silent and sat down. These mice are nothing to do with me, she shouted. These mice are pet mice. These mice are quite obviously belonging to some repellent little child in the hotel. A boy it will be for a certainty, because girls are not keeping pet mice. A boy? cried the witches. A filthy, smelly little boy. We'll swipe him. We'll swizzle him. We'll have his tripes for breakfast. Silence! shouted the Grand High Witch, raising her hands. You know perfectly well you must do nothing to draw attention to yourselves while you are living in the hotel. Let us, by all means, get rid of this evil-smelling little squirt, but we must do it as quietly as possible. For are we not all of us the most respectable ladies of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children? What do you suggest then, O oh brainy one? they cried out. How shall we dispose of this small pile of filth? They're talking about me, I thought. These females are actually talking about how to kill me. I began to sweat. Whoever he is, he is not important, announced the Grand High Witch. Leave him to me. I shall smell him out and turn him into a mackerel and have him dished up for supper. Bravo! cried the witches. Cut off his head and chop off his tail and fry him in hot butter. You can imagine that none of this was making me feel very comfortable. William and Mary were still running around on the platform, and I saw the Grand High Witch aim a swift running kick at William. She caught him right on the point of her toe and sent him flying. She did the same to Mary. Her aim was extraordinary. She would have made a great football player. Both mice crashed against the wall, and for a few moments they lay stunned. Then they got to their feet and scampered away. Attention again, the Grand High Witch was shouting. I will now give to you the recipe for concocting Formula 86 Delayed Action Mouse Maker. Get out pencils and paper. Handbags were opened all over the room, and notebooks were fished out. Give us the recipe, O oh brainy one, cried the audience impatiently. Tell us the secret. First, said the Grand High Witch, I had to find something that would cause the children to become very small very quickly. And what was that? cried the audience. That part was simple, said the Grand High Witch. 
All you have to do, if you are wishing to make a child very small, is to look at him through the wrong end of a telescope. She's a wonder, cried the audience. Who else would have thought of a thing like that? So, you take the wrong end of a telescope, continued the Grand High Witch, and you boil it until it gets soft. How long does that take? they asked her. Twenty-one hours of boiling, answered the Grand High Witch. And while this is going on, you take exactly forty-five brown mice and you chop off their tails with a carving knife. And you fry the tails in hair oil until they are nice and crisp. What do we do with all those mice who have had their tails chopped off? asked the audience. You simmer them in frog juice for one hour, came the answer. But listen to me. So far, I have only given you the easy part of the recipe. The really difficult problem is to put in something that vile have a genuine delayed action result. Something that can be eaten by children on a certain day, but which will not start working on them until nine o'clock the next morning, when they arrive at school. What did you come up with, O oh brainy one? they called out. Tell us the great secret. The secret, announced the Grand High Witch triumphantly, is an alarm clock. An alarm clock, they cried. It's a stroke of genius. Of course it is, said the Grand High Witch. You can set a 24-hour alarm clock today and at exactly nine o'clock tomorrow, it will go off. But we will need five million alarm clocks, cried the audience. We will need one for each child. Idiots! shouted the Grand High Witch. If you are wanting a steak, you do not cook the whole cow. It is the same with alarm clocks. One clock will make enough for a thousand children. Here is what you do. You set your alarm clock to go off at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Then you roast it in the oven until it is crisp and tender. Are you writing this down? We are, your grandness. We are, they cried. Next, the Grand High Witch said, you take your boiled telescope and your fried mouse tails and your cooked mice and your roasted alarm clock and all together... You put them into the mixer. Then you mix them at full speed. This will give you a nice thick paste. While the mixer is still mixing, you must add to it the yolk of one gruntle's egg. A gruntle's egg, cried the audience. We shall do that. 
Underneath all the clamour that was going on, I heard one witch in the back row saying to her neighbour, I'm getting a bit old to go birds nesting. Those ruddy gruntles always nest very high up. So, you mix in the egg, the Grand High Witch went on, and one after the other you also mix in the following items. The claw of a crab cruncher, the beak of a blubber snitch, the snout of a grubblesvert, and the tongue of a cat sprunger. I trust you are not having any trouble finding those. None at all, they cried out. We will spear the blabber snitch and trap the crab cruncher and shoot the grubble squirt and catch the cat springer in his burrow. Excellent, said the Grand High Witch. Then you have mixed everything together in the mixer. You will have a most marvellous looking green liquid. Put one drop, just one titchy droplet of this liquid into a chocolate or a sweet. And... At nine o'clock the next morning, the child who ate it will turn into a mouse in twenty-six seconds. But one word of warning. Never increase the dose. Never put more than one drop into each sweet or chocolate. And never give more than one sweet or chocolate to each child. An overdose of delayed action mouse maker will mess up the timing of the alarm clock and cause the child to turn into a mouse too early. A large overdose might even have an instant effect, and you wouldn't want that, would you? You wouldn't want the children turning into mice right there in your sweet shops. That would give the game away. So be very careful. Do not overdose. That brings us to the end of chapter nine. I'm going to pretty much head straight on with the next chapter and keep the flow. All right, good times. Let's press on. So this is chapter 10. Bruno Jenkins disappeared. The Grand High Witch was starting to talk again. I am now going to prove to you, she said, that this recipe is working to perfection. You understand, of course, that you can set the alarm clock to go off at any time you like. It does not have to be nine o'clock. So, yesterday, I am personally preparing a small quantity of the magic formula in order to give to you a public demonstration. But I am making one 
small change in the recipe. Before I am roasting the alarm clock, I am setting it to go off not at nine o'clock the next morning, but at half past three the next afternoon. Which means half past three this afternoon. And that, she said, glancing at her wristwatch, is in precisely seven minutes time. The audience of witches was listening intently, sensing that something dramatic was about to happen. So, what am I doing yesterday with this magic liquid? asked the Grand High Witch. I will tell you what I am doing. I am putting one droplet of it into a very squishy chocolate bar, and I am giving this bar to a repulsive, smelly little boy who is hanging round the lobby of the hotel. The Grand High Witch paused. The audience remained silent, waiting for her to go on. I watched this repulsive little brute gobbling up the squishy bar of chocolate, and when he had finished, I said to him, Was that good? He said it was great. So I said to him, Would you like some more? And he said, Yes. So I said, I will give you six more chocolate bars like that if you will meet me in the ballroom of this hotel at twenty-five past three tomorrow afternoon. Six bars, cried this greedy little swine. I'll be there. You Bet I'll be there. So, the stage is set, shouted the Grand High Witch. The proof of the pudding is about to begin. Do not forget that before I am roasting the alarm clock yesterday, I am setting it for half past three today. It is now, she glanced again at her watch, it is now exactly twenty-five minutes past three, and the nasty little stinker who will be turning into a mouse in five minutes' time should, at this very moment, be standing outside the doors. And by gum, she was absolutely right. The boy, whoever he might be, was already rattling the door handle and banging on the doors with his fist. Crick! shrieked the Grand High Witch. Put on your wigs, put on your gloves, put on your shoes. There was a great rustle and bustle of putting on wigs and gloves and shoes, and I saw the Grand High Witch herself reach for her face mask and put it on over that revolting face of hers. It was astonishing how that mask transformed her. All of a sudden she became once again a rather pretty young lady. Let me in! came the boy's voice from behind the doors. Where are those chocolate bars you promised me? I'm here to collect. Dish them out! 
he is not only smelly, he is also greedy, said the Grand High Witch. Remove the chains from the doors and let him come in. The extraordinary thing about the mask was that its lips moved quite naturally when she spoke. You really couldn't see it was a mask at all. One of the witches leapt to her feet and unfastened the chains. She opened the two huge doors. Then I heard her saying, Why, hello, little man. How lovely to see you. You have come for your chocolate bars, have you not? They are all ready for you. Do come in. A small boy wearing a white t-shirt and grey shorts and gym shoes entered the room. I recognised him at once. He was called Bruno Jenkins, and he was staying in the hotel with his parents. I didn't care for him. He was one of those boys who is always eating something whenever you meet him. Meet him in the hotel lobby and he is stuffing sponge cake into his mouth. Pass him in the corridor and he is fishing potato crisps out of a bag by the fistful. Catch sight of him in the hotel garden and he's wolfing a dairy milk bar and there's two more sticking out of his trouser pocket. What's more, Bruno never stopped boasting about how his father made more money than my father, and that they owned three cars. But worse than that, yesterday morning I had found him kneeling on the flagstones of the hotel terrace with a magnifying glass in his hand. There was a column of ants marching across one of the flagstones, and Bruno Jenkins was focusing the sun through his magnifying glass and roasting the ants one by one. I like watching them burn, he said. That's horrible, I cried. Stop doing it. Let's see you stop me, he said. At that point, I'd pushed him with all my might and he had crashed sideways onto the flagstones. His magnifying glass had splintered into many pieces and he had leapt up shrieking, My father is going to get you for this! Then he had run off, presumably to find his wealthy dad. That was the last time I had seen Bruno Jenkins until now. I doubted very much that he was about to be turned into a mouse, although I must confess that I was secretly hoping it might happen. Either way, I didn't envy him being up there in front of all those witches. Darling boy, cooed the Grand High Witch from up on the platform. I have your chocolates all ready for you. Do come up here first and say hello to all these lovely ladies. Her voice was quite different now. It was soft and gentle and absolutely dripping with syrup. Bruno was looking a bit bewildered, but he allowed himself to be led up onto the platform where he stood beside the Grand High Witch and said, Okay, where are my six bars of chocolate? I saw the witch who had let him in quietly putting the chain back on the door handles. Bruno didn't notice this. He was too busy asking for his chocolate. The time is now one minute before half past three, announced the Grand High Witch. What the heck's going on? Bruno asked. He wasn't frightened, but he wasn't looking exactly comfortable either. What is this? He said. Give me my chocolate. Thirty seconds to go, cried the Grand High Witch. 
gripping Bruno by the arm. Bruno shook himself clear and stared at her. She stared back at him, smiling with the lips of her mask. Every witch in the audience was staring at Bruno. Twenty seconds, cried the Grand High Witch. Give me the chocolate, shouted Bruno, becoming suddenly suspicious. Give me the chocolate and let me out of here. Fifteen seconds, cried the Grand High Witch. Will one of you crazy punks kindly tell me what all this is about? Shouted Bruno. Ten seconds, cried the Grand High Witch. Nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have ignition! I could have sworn I heard an alarm clock ringing. I saw Bruno jump. He jumped as though someone had stuck a hat pin deep into his bottom and he yelled, Ow! He jumped so high that he landed on a small table up there on the stage, and he started hopping about on top of this table, waving his arms and yelling his head off. Then suddenly he became silent. His whole body stiffened. The alarm clock has gone off, shrieked the Grand High Witch. The mouse maker is beginning to work. She started hopping about on the platform and clapping her gloved hands together, and then she shouted out, This smelly brat! This filthy scum! This horrid little louse! Will very, very soon become a lovely little mouse! Bruno was getting smaller by the second. I could see him shrinking. Now his clothes seemed to be disappearing and brown fur was growing all over his body. Suddenly he had a tail, and then he had whiskers. Now he had four feet. It was all happening so quickly. It was a matter of seconds only. And all at once, he wasn't there any more. A small brown mouse was running around on the tabletop. Bravo! yelled the audience. She's done it! It works! It's fantastic! It's colossal! It's the greatest yet! You are a miracle, oh brainy... You are a miracle, oh brainy one! They were all standing up and clapping and cheering and the Grand High Witch produced a mouse trap from the folds of her dress and started to set it. Oh, no, I thought. I don't want to see this. Bruno Jenkins may have been a bit of a stinker, but I'm dashed if I want to watch him having his head chopped off. There is he! snapped the Grand High Witch, searching the platform. Where has that mouse got to? She couldn't find him. Clever Bruno must have jumped down off the table and scampered off into some corner, or even down a small hall. Thank heavens for that. It matters not shouted the Grand High Witch. Silence! And sit down! And that is the end of chapter 10. Okay, let
let's have picture time whilst you recover. So here is the Grand High Witch still maskless, booting poor William and Mary. She's a rotter. She's an absolute rotter. Oh, you see the other one like launching off there, yeah. And we have the bald witches with their itchy scalps furiously taking notes. They don't want to get into trouble and be sizzled and puffed into smoke. And then we have the chopped off mouse tails ready for the potion. Here is some of your best frog juice, always handy to have in the cupboards at home. You never know when you might need it. We've got alarm clock ready. Always struggles to focus, does this? Let me like, just, I'm trying to practice here, but if it doesn't want to focus, it just doesn't want to focus. And here's the telescope. And uh, a Gruntle's egg, of course. I know you're um, you're all very familiar with the Gruntle, um, so you know you know that they look rather like a potato. But um, the shell is obviously much thicker than potato skin. But from a distance, especially in dark lighting, they they can be confused. But it would be unlikely to find a potato so high up in the trees. You know, these nests are often in very peculiar places and very difficult to reach um, but side by side could be confused um, and we also have the claw of a crab cruncher very distinctive claws very sharp curved talons and we also have the beak of the blabber snitch. Yeah, there is the blabber snitch. Mm. Or at least the beak of it, yeah. And then we also have the snout of a grubber squat. Yeah, ah, it is a little like a, a pig, sort of mixed with the anteater. Very useful to have the snout of the grubble's fur just in case you'll need it, you know. And we also have the tongue of a cat springer. They are, of course, very small creatures, but with very, very, very long tongues. A strange anomaly of evolution, but useful for certain portions. And then we go into the Bruno Jenkins chapter, yeah. Here he is. Teresa noticed that I read him a little bit like I read the Dudley in Harry Potter, yeah. Here he is, being led in by the kind witches, all with their wigs back on now, and the gloves and the shoes. And the Grand High Witch, looking so much more pleasant now. How could you not trust her? And her voice somewhat magically seems to soften. You can still tell it's her, of course. Um, but a little less intimidating, honey-tongued, and then we have the transformation of Bruno. Let's see if I can do it justice, I'm not sure if I can, but I will try. Boy, losing clothes, fur tail, whiskers, 
four legs rather than arms more for tail developing shrinking 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 brown mouse but has Bruno managed to escape I mean he may be a little brown mouse now um, like we've said before I don't know if that does affect his life expectancy he may be able to live to be a 80 year old brown mouse if he's lucky there's a lot of dangers out there but still certainly a better fate than being decapitated by one of the Grand High Witch's mouse traps, no? But another great couple of chapters there. I really, really hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, supposed to be a very silly sort of German accent. Um, you know, we were saying that the Grand High Witch certainly has some likenesses to a particularly famous historical figure. Um, and then with the mention of Bruno Jenkins, it was making me think of uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's Bruno, if you've seen that film. Yes, I guess that would very much be the case, Lynette, actually, when she's describing him as a smelly boy. He must be quite a clean boy. So, if you haven't bathed in ages, as he was saying in one of the other chapters, then the stink waves won't be emanating half as strongly. All the muck and dirt and such blocks that from the witch's nose holes, as Dahl describes it. Yeah. You were filling her in there. Yeah. <laughs> the Grand High Witch, yeah, she's very musical, actually. I admire that. Oh, and welcome to Amira as well. Nice to see you. I've not seen you for a little while. Welcome to the stream. That's lovely. Um, I think I'd said hello to you, Ju Tang. If not, hello again. You can always have an extra hello. I know, I got way too carried away and that accidentally nearly smashed the pop filter off. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty pretty dark themes. It was a funny looking alarm clock. Uh, thank you for helping Stosh and welcome to the stream, Stosh. Nice to have you here. Welcome to the Foxy Book Club. Um, yeah, they're, they're real. They are real mango. Could never just be a story with Roald Dahl. You know that it's gonna get serious. Um, it seems like you've been really, really enjoying this one, so I feel like I should have a third chapter of the day and go for chapter 11. I'm sure you won't mind a little bit more from the witches today. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ada. Um, and yeah, if I don't have any problems with these live streams, uh, with reading Roald Dahl in the live stream, then I will certainly try one of his other books. Um, so you know I've got Fantastic Mr. Fox available through Patreon. It used to be on my old YouTube channel, but got taken down, unfortunately. Um, but I would absolutely love to read more Roald Dahl. Teresa's mentioning Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, absolutely wonderful. And there's many, many, many other wonderful Roald Dahl books, of course. Oh, don't you worry, Mama Fox. <laughs> you want some of Roald Dahl's poems in between the readings? Interesting idea, Lynette. I might try and squeeze those in, maybe in between a couple of chapters from different books on a different stream. It's a good idea. I don't have anything prepared today. <clears throat> mm. 
<laughs> nice timing. Hmm. Could be a dangerous time to snooze. Okay. So, let's have one more chapter. The Ancient Ones. The Grand High Witch stood on the very centre of the platform, and those dangerous eyes of hers travelled slowly around the audience of witches who were sitting so meekly before her. All those over seventy, put up your hands, she barked suddenly. Seven or eight hands went up in the air. It comes to me, said the Grand High Witch, that you ancient ones will not be able to climb high trees in search of Gruntal's eggs. We won't, your grandness. We are afraid we won't, chanted the Ancient Ones. Nor will you be able to catch the Crab Cruncher who lives high up on rocky cliffs. The Grand High Witch went on. I can't exactly see you sprinting after the speedy Cat Springer, either. Or diving into deep waters to spear the Blabbersnitch. Or striding the bleak moors with a gun under your arm to shoot the Grobbelskvart. You are too old and feeble for those things. We are, chanted the Ancient Ones. We are, we are. You Ancient Ones have served me well over many years said the Grand High Witch. And I do not wish to deny you the pleasure of bumping off a few thousand children each just because you have become old and feeble. I have therefore prepared personally, with my own hands, a limited quantity of delayed action mouse maker which I will distribute to the ancient ones before you leave the hotel. Oh, thank you, thank you, cried the old witches. You are far too good to us, your grandness. You are so kind and thoughtful. Here! is a sample of what I am giving you, shouted the Grand High Witch. She fished around in a pocket of her dress and brought out a very small bottle. She held it up and shouted, In this tiny bottle is five hundred doses of mouse maker. Is enough to turn five hundred children into mice. I could see that the bottle was made of dark blue glass, and that it was very small, about the same size as the ones you can buy at the chemist with nose drops in them. Each of you ancient ones will get two of these bottles, she shouted. Oh, thank you, thank you, all most generous and thoughtful one, chorused the ancient witches. Not one drop will be wasted. 
Each of us will promise to squish and squallop and squiggle one thousand children. Our meeting is over, announced the Grand High Witch. Here is the timetable for the remainder of your stay in this hotel. Right now, we must all go out onto the Sunshine Terrace and have tea with that ridiculous manager. Next, at six o'clock, those witches who are too old to climb trees after Gruntor's eggs will report to my room to receive two bottles each of mouse maker. My room number is four five four. Do not forget it. Then at eight o'clock all of you will assemble in the dining room for supper. We are the lovely ladies of the RSPCC, and they are setting up two long tables specially for us. But do not forget to put the cotton plugs up your noses. That dining room will be full of filthy little children, and without the nose plugs, the stink will be unbearable. Apart from that, remember to behave normally at all times. Is everything clear? Any questions? I have one question, your grandness, said a voice in the audience. What happens if one of the chocolates we are giving away in our shops gets eaten by a grown-up? That's just too bad for the grown-up, said the Grand High Witch. This Meeting is over. Out you go. The witches stood up and began gathering their things together. I was watching them through the crack and hoping to heaven they would hurry up and leave so that I might be safe at last. Wait! shrieked one of the witches in the back row. Hold everything! Her shrieking voice echoed through the ballroom like a trumpet. All the witches suddenly stopped and turned and looked towards the speaker. She was one of the taller witches, and I could see her standing there with her head tilted back and her nose in the air and she was sucking in great long breaths of air through those curvy pink sea-shelly nostrils of hers. Wait! She shrieked again. What is it? The others cried out. Dog's droppings! Surely not, the others shouted. There couldn't be. Yes, yes, shouted the first witch. There it is again. It's not strong, but it's there. I mean, it's here. It's definitely somewhere not too far away. What's going on down there? shouted the Grand High Witch. 
glaring down from the platform. Mildred's just got a whiff of dog's droppings, your grandness. Someone called back to her. What rubbish is this? shouted the Grand High Witch. She has dog's droppings on the brain. There are no children in this room. Hang on, cried the witch called Mildred. Hang on. Hang on, everybody, don't move. I'm getting it again. Her huge curvy nose holes were waving in and out like a pair of fish tails. It's, it's getting stronger. It's hitting me harder now. Can't the rest of you smell it? All the noses of all the witches in the room went up in the air, and all the nostrils began to suck and sniff. Oh, she's right, cried another voice. She's absolutely right. Dog's droppings, it is strong and foul. In a matter of seconds, the entire assembly of witches had taken up the dreaded cry of dog's droppings. Dog's droppings! They shouted. The room is... Oh, the room is full of it! Poo! 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 Why did we not smell it before? Oh, it stings like sewer. Some little swine must be hiding not so very far away from here. Find it! Screamed the Grand High Witch. Track it down! Rootle it out! Follow your noses till you get it! The hairs on my head were standing up like the bristles of a nail brush, and a cold sweat was breaking out all over me. Rootle it out! The small lump of dung! Screeched the Grand High Witch. Don't let it escape! If it is in here, it has observed the most secret things. It must be exterminated immediately! Here is Mildred, the tall and very keen nostrilled witch at the back there, doing a splendid job. I, I would imagine that the Grand High Witch, once she calms down, will um, be rather proud of her, I think. If she does pride, I'm not sure. I mean, she she is sort of generous in her own strange way. I was a little bit worried for the ancient ones for a moment there. I was thinking that she was saying, oh, you know, you're too old um, and feeble to climb the trees and shoot the thingamabobbies and hunt for the whatevers and chase the cat springers and things. You, you know, you have no purpose here. And she was going to fizzle them or have some weird task that they had to do. But no, she's she's actually prepared, hand prepared, with her clawy hands. Two bottles for each of those individuals. So that they could take out 500 children with each bottle. 1,000 in total. As uh, sort of a reward for their fine service over all those years. So she does have a softer side. She does have a softer side to her. Um, I was just briefly showing you this picture during the reading as well of her standing up triumphant with the pre-prepared bottles. Um, I wouldn't exactly describe her as pretty, uh, to be honest. Like, I, you know, I see pretty in comparison 
to the maskless face, but still rather disturbing. Oh, you can actually see the seashell-shaped nose holes, the nostrils are here in the picture. A nice detail. Are there any sniveling children in the stream? I can't smell dog's droppings. But you never know, there may be filthy children among you. Oh! Welcome to Danielle Forkin! Very nice to see you. Although, I think I spy a child on your picture that I'm not so happy about. But welcome, all the same. Welcome, I suppose. Hmm. So, where are we? Here we are. Chapter 12. Metamorphosis. I remember thinking to myself, there is no escape for me now. Even if I make a run for it and manage to dodge the lot of them, I still won't get out because the doors are chained and locked. I'm finished. I'm done for. Oh, Grandmama, what are they going to do to me? I looked round, and I saw a hideous, painted, and powdered witch's face staring down at me, and the face opened its mouth and yelled triumphantly, it's here! Behind the screen! Come and get it! The witch reached out a gloved hand and grabbed me by the hair, but I twisted free and jumped away. I ran, oh how I ran! The sheer terror of it all put wings on my feet. I flew around the outside of the great ballroom and not one of them had a chance of catching me. As I came level with the doors, I paused and tried to open them, but the big chain was on them, and they didn't even rattle. The witches were not bothering to chase me. They simply stood there in small groups, watching me, and knowing for certain that there was no way I could escape. Several of them were holding their noses with gloved fingers, and there were cries of, Boo! What a stink! Oh, we can't stand this much longer! Catch it then, you idiots! Screamed the Grand High Witch from up on the platform. Spread out in a line across the room and close in on it and grab it! Corner this filthy little gumboil and seize it and bring it up here to me. The witches spread out as they were told. They advanced towards me, some from one end, some from the other, and some came down the middle between the rows of empty chairs. They were bound to get me now. They had me cornered. From sheer and absolute terror, I began to scream. Help! I screamed, turning my head towards the doors in the hope that somebody outside might hear me. Help! 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 Get it! shouted the Grand High Witch. Grab hold of it! 
Stop it yelling! They rushed at me then, and about five of them grabbed me by the arms and legs and lifted me clear off the ground. I went on screaming, but one of them clapped a gloved hand over my mouth, and that stopped me. Bring it here! shouted the Grand High Witch. Bring the spying little worm up here to me! I was carried onto the platform with my arms and legs held tight by many hands, and I lay there suspended in the air, facing the ceiling. I saw the Grand High Witch standing over me, grinning at me in the most horrible way. She held up the small blue bottle of Mouse Maker, and she said, Now, for a little medicine, hold his nose to make him open his mouth. Strong fingers pinched my nose. I kept my mouth closed tight and held my breath. But I couldn't do it for long. My chest was bursting. I opened my mouth to get one big quick breath of air, and as I did so, the Grand High Witch poured the entire contents of the little bottle down my throat. Oh, the pain and the fire. It felt as though a kettle full of boiling water had been poured into my mouth. My throat was going up in flames. Then very quickly the frightful burning, searing, scorching feeling started spreading down into my chest and into my tummy and on and on into my arms and legs and all over my body. I screamed and screamed but once again the gloved hand was clapped over my lips. The next thing... I felt was my skin beginning to tighten. How else can I describe it? It was quite literally a tightening and a shrinking of the skin all over my body from the top of my head to the tips of my fingers to the end of my toes. I felt as though I was a balloon and somebody was twisting the top of the balloon and twisting and twisting and the balloon was getting smaller and smaller and the skin was getting tighter and tighter, and soon it was going to burst. Then the squeezing began. This time I was inside a suit of iron, and somebody was turning a screw, and with each turn of the screw the iron suit became smaller and smaller so that I was squeezed like an orange into a pulpy mess with the juice running out of my sides. After that, there came a fierce, prickling sensation all over my skin, or what was left of my skin, as though tiny needles were forcing their way out through the surface of the skin from the inside, and this, I realise now, was the growing of the mouse fur. Far away in the distance, I heard the voice of the Grand High Witch yelling, Five hundred doses! This stinking little carbuncle has had five hundred doses, and the alarm clock has been smashed, and now... We are having instantaneous action. I heard clapping and cheering, and I remember thinking, I am not myself any longer. I have gone clear out of my own skin. I noticed that the floor was only an inch from my nose. I noticed also a pair of little furry front paws resting on the floor. I was able to move those paws. They were mine. 
At that moment, I realized that I was not a little boy any longer. I was a mouse. Now for the mouse trap! I heard the Grand High Witch yelling. I've got it right here. And here's a piece of cheese. But I wasn't going to wait for that. I was off across the platform like a streak of lightning. I was astonished at my own speed. I leapt over witch's feet right and left, and in no time at all I was down the steps and onto the floor of the ballroom itself and skittering off among the rows of chairs. What I especially liked was the fact that I made no sound at all as I ran. I was a swift and silent mover. And quite amazingly, the pain had all gone now. I was feeling quite remarkably well. It is not a bad thing after all, I thought to myself. To be tiny as well as speedy when there is a bunch of dangerous females after your blood. I selected the back leg of a chair and squeezed up against it and kept very still. In the distance, the Grand High Witch was shouting, Leave the little stink pot alone. It is not worth bothering about. It is only a mouse now. Somebody else will soon catch it. Let us get out of here. The meeting is over. Unlock the doors and shove off to the Sunshine Terrace to have tea with that idiotic manager. Oh my, he is no longer a little boy, but a mouse. Let's have a brief picture time of chapter 12. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, hello to Ada. It seems like you've been having some problems with the stream. I don't know if you've got yourself further back into the stream or if it's your connection. I'm not sure. I hope you figure it out. Um, but yes, first picture from Metamorphosis is uh, quite disturbing, really. I must say. So, it's a group of the witches carrying the poor little boy, gloved hand over mouth, to be taken in front of the Grand High Witch. Note also, noses covered, nose holes blocked. They do not want to stink their selves with that smelly boy. Yeah, Quentin Blake has got a wonderful style. Very unique. Oh, I'm sorry you're having problems with the chat, Ada. I hope that gets sorted out. Sounds like you're doing the right thing if you've been refreshing. Have you refreshed the whole stream? Have you tried refreshing the whole page? Or if you're on um, if you're on mobile, try going back to the home screen and actually closing the app and then going back in. I hope you get it fixed. And here's the second picture. The boy is off. See you later, suckers. 
So he seems to be coming to terms with the fact that he's a mouse pretty quick. And the Grand High Witch, as with Bruno, says, look, don't bother, don't waste your time trying to get him. But they seem to really struggle with this part of their plan seems to be inherently flawed. That they are not very good at catching the mice once they've turned the children into a mouse. So they have the child held, but then once he suddenly shrinks, they're struggling. He's off. Bye-bye. Um, feels like this could cause problems for the witches. Let's see. They don't seem to have a spell or something just to zap the mouse, stop it in its tracks. They Maybe they don't want to waste the magic. Maybe, maybe they've got limited mana points and they want, to, they want to store that up for later. I don't know, but it feels... Maybe they maybe they're just so cocky that they feel like it's just it's beneath them to chase the mice. Um, that's the that's the work for the humans to do. They will, you know, they, they probably get more satisfaction in thinking that the humans have been killing children without realizing than them bothering to waste their time. Because obviously they can they can kill children and do all sorts of weird things to children if they want to. But she's coming up with this special plan, so. Maybe it's a way of sort of keeping their hands clean in a way. We will see. But we will we will also see whether this is going to come back to bite them in the bottom, so to speak. Um, I don't believe we know the boy's name. It's often like that. Um, yeah, in fact, if you go to the front, I thought I'd seen the little cast at the start. Um, the boy is just called boy, but this is a theme with Roald Dahl. I mean, one of the books, one of his books is just called boy, if I remember rightly. Um, but you know, this is quite a common theme with many stories that main characters don't even need to be named. Um, if you've seen High Maintenance, for example, um, like that, the lead character there, I think he is just called like the dude or something like that <laughs> um so like the unnamed aspect is sometimes part of the mystery there's some films like this too um maybe they conclude with the reveal of the name or who it is or something at some point um okay so we are going to continue with what is technically chapter 13 Terrible of you, Lynette. You're going to have a hell of a fine. <laughs> if you take that back now. They'll be like, that's 700 pounds, please. Okay. Are we ready for the next chapter? I hope so. Here we go. Bruno. I peeped round the leg of the chair and watched the hundreds of witches' feet walking out through the doors of the ballroom. When they had all gone and the place was absolutely silent, I began to move cautiously about on the floor. Suddenly, I remembered Bruno. He must surely be around here somewhere, too. Bruno, I called out. I wasn't seriously expecting that I would be able to speak at all now that I had become a mouse, so I got the shock of my life when I heard my own voice, my own perfectly normal, rather loud voice, coming out of my tiny mouth. It was wonderful. I was thrilled. I tried it again. Bruno Jenkins, where are you? I called out. If you can hear me, give a shout. 
My voice was exactly the same and just as loud as it had been when I was a boy. Hey there, Bruno Jenkins, I called. Where are you? There was no answer. I pottered about between the seat legs, trying to get used to being so close to the ground. I decided I rather liked it. You are probably wondering why I wasn't depressed at all. I found myself thinking, What's so wonderful about being a little boy anyway? Why is that necessarily any better than being a mouse? I know that mice get hunted and they sometimes get poisoned or caught in traps, but little boys sometimes get killed too. Little boys can be run over by motor cars or they can die of some awful illness. Little boys have to go to school. Mice don't. Mice don't have to pass exams. Mice don't have to worry about money. Mice, as far as I can see, have only two enemies, humans and cats. My grandmother is a human, but I know for certain that she will always love me whoever I am. And she never, thank goodness, keeps a cat. When mice grow up, they don't ever have to go to war and fight against other mice. Mice, I felt pretty certain, all like each other. People don't. Yes, I told myself, I don't think it is at all bad a thing to be a mouse. I was wandering around the ballroom floor thinking about all this when I spotted another mouse. It was crouching on the floor, holding a piece of bread in its front paws and nibbling away at it with great gusto. It had to be Bruno. Hello, Bruno, I said. He glanced up at me for about two seconds, then went right on guzzling. What have you found? I asked him. One of them dropped it, he answered. It's a fish paste sandwich. Pretty good. He too spoke with a perfectly normal voice. One would have expected that a mouse, if it was going to talk at all, would do so with the smallest and squeakiest voice you could imagine. It was terribly funny to hear the voice of the rather loud-mouthed Bruno coming out of that tiny mouse's throat. Listen, Bruno, I said. Now that we are both mice, I think we ought to start thinking a bit about the future. He stopped eating and stared at me with small black eyes. What do you mean, we? He said. The fact that you're a mouse has nothing to do with me. But you're a mouse too, Bruno. Don't be a fool, he said. I'm not a mouse. I'm afraid you are, Bruno. I most certainly am not, he shouted. Why are you insulting me? I haven't been rude to you. Why do you call me a mouse? Don't you know what's happened to you? I said. What on earth are you talking about? Bruno said. I have to inform you, I said, that not very long ago the witches turned you into a mouse. Then they did it to me. You're lying! He cried. I'm not a mouse! If you hadn't been so busy guzzling that sandwich, I said, you would have noticed your hairy paws. Take a look at them. Bruno looked down at his paws. He jumped. Good grief! He cried. 
I am a mouse. You wait till my father hears about this. He may think it's an improvement, I said. I don't want to be a mouse, Bruno shouted, jumping up and down. I refuse to be a mouse. I'm Bruno Jenkins. There are worse things than being a mouse, I said. You can live in a hole. I don't want to live in a hole, Bruno shouted. And you can creep into the larder at night, I said. And nibble through all the packets of raisins and cornflakes and chocolate biscuits and everything else you can find. You can stay there all night eating yourself silly. That's what mice do. Now, that's a thought, Bruno said, perking up a bit. But how am I going to open the door of the fridge to get at the cold chicken and all the leftovers? That's something I do every evening at home. Maybe your rich father will get you a special little mouse fridge all to yourself, I said. One that you can open. You say a witch did this to me, Bruno said. Which witch? The one who gave you the chocolate bar in the hotel lobby yesterday, I told him. Don't you remember? The filthy old cow, he shouted. I'll get her for this. Where is she? Who is she? Forget it. I said. You don't have a hope. Your biggest problem at the moment is your parents. How are they going to take this? Will they treat you with sympathy and kindness? Bruno considered this for a moment. I think, he said, that my father is going to be a bit put out. And your mother? She's terrified of mice, Bruno said. Then you've got a problem, haven't you? Why only me? He said. What about you? My grandmother will understand perfectly, I said. She knows all about witches. Bruno took another bite of his sandwich. What do you suggest? He said. I suggest we both go first of all and consult my grandmother. I said. She'll know exactly what to do. I moved towards the doors, which were standing open. Bruno, still grasping part of the sandwich in one paw, followed after me. When we get out into the corridor, I said, we're going to run like mad. Stick close to the wall all the way and follow me. Do not talk and do not let anyone see you. Don't forget that just about anyone who catches sight of you will try to kill you. I snatched the sandwich out of his paw and threw it away. Here goes, I said. Keep behind me. And there they go. It's going to be a risky journey, I think. Bruno looking, come on camera, focus for me. I don't want to focus on the picture. I'm a rubbish webcam, I don't want you. There we go. I suppose I can just to look at the sandwich. So yes, Bruno looking longingly back at the bit of sandwich. And here is 
our boy finding Bruno, who doesn't realise that he's no longer quite Bruno, eating his sandwich. <laughs> Gosh, this camera really struggles to focus on these pictures. But there they are. And also Bruno being forced. He's not the brightest spark, but being forced to realise that he is a mouse. Oh, I wanted to get a clear shot of that one, but it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I, I warned you, did I not? I did warn you that some of these chapters were very short. This should come as no surprise. But I also said that because some of the chapters are very short and you've been behaving yourselves and that we've been really enjoying the witches that I will do three chapters and the good news oops the good news is that this is quite a long one by witches standards anyway so this is technically chapter 14 Hello, Grandmama. As soon as I was, I was out of the ballroom, I took off like a flash. I streaked down the corridor, went through the lounge and the reading room and the library and the drawing room, and came to the stairs. Up the stairs I went, jumping quite easily from one to the other, keeping well in against the wall all the time. Are you with me, Bruno? I whispered. Right here, he said. My grandmother's room and my own were on the fifth floor. It was quite a climb, but we made it without meeting a single person on the way because everyone was using the lift. On the fifth floor, I raced along the corridor to the door of my grandmother's room. A pair of her shoes were standing outside the door to the... There's actually a mistake in the book. It says, outside the door to the cleaned. But that must be outside the door to be cleaned. Or for the cleaner, but that's a bigger mistake. <sighs> what can you do? What can you do, eh? Amateurs. These book publishers. What are they paid for, eh? I don't know. I don't know. A pair of her shoes was standing outside the door to be cleaned. Bruno was alongside me. What do we do now? He said. Suddenly, I caught sight of a chambermaid coming along the corridor towards us. I saw at once that she was the one who had reported me to the manager for keeping white mice. Not, therefore, the sort of person I wanted to meet in my present condition. Quick, I said to Bruno, hide in one of those shoes. I hopped into one shoe and Bruno hopped into the other. I waited for the maid to walk past us. She didn't. When she came to the shoes, she bent down and picked them up. In doing this, she put her hand right inside one that I was hiding in. When one of her fingers touched me, I bit it. It was a silly thing to do, but I did it instinctively without thinking. 
The maid let out a scream that must have been heard by ships far out in the English Channel, and she dropped the shoes and ran like the wind down the corridor. My grandmother's door opened. What on earth is going on out here? She said. I darted between her legs into her room, and Bruno followed me. Close the door, Grandmama! I cried. Please hurry! She looked around, and saw two small brown mouse on the carpet. Please close it! I said. And this time, she actually saw me talking and recognised my voice. She froze and became absolutely motionless. Every part of her body, her fingers and hands and arms and head, suddenly became as stiff as a marble statue. Her face turned even paler than marble, and her eyes were stretched so wide I could see the whites all around them. Then she started to tremble. I thought she was going to faint and fall over. Please close the door quickly, Grandmama, I said. That awful maid might come in. She somehow managed to gather herself together enough to close the door. She leaned against it, staring down at me, white-faced and shaking all over. I saw tears beginning to come out of her eyes and go dribbling down her cheeks. Don't cry, Grandmama, I said. Things could be a lot worse. I did get away from them. I'm still alive. So is Bruno. Very slowly, she bent down and picked me up with one hand. Then she picked Bruno up with the other hand and put us both on the table. There was a bowl of bananas in the centre of the table, and Bruno jumped straight into it and began tearing away with his teeth at one of the banana skins to get at the fruit inside. My grandmother grasped the arm of her chair to steady herself, but her eyes never left me. Sit down, dear Grandmama, I said. She collapsed into her chair. Oh, my darling, she murmured, and now the tears were really streaming down her cheeks. Oh, my poor sweet darling, what have they done to you? I know what they've done, Grandmama, and I know what I am. But the funny thing is that I don't honestly feel especially bad about it. I don't even feel angry. In fact, I feel rather good. I know I'm not a boy any longer, and I never will be again, but I'll be quite all right as long as there's always you to look after me. I was not just trying to console her. I was being absolutely honest about the way I felt. You may think it odd that I wasn't weeping myself, it was odd. I simply can't explain it. Of course I'll look after you, my grandmother murmured. Who is the other one? That was a boy called Bruno Jenkins, I told her. They got him first. My grandmother took a new long black cigar out of a case in her handbag and put it in her mouth. Then she got out a box of matches. She struck a match, but her fingers were striking, were shaking so much that the flame kept missing the end of the cigar. When she got it lit at last, she took a long pull and sucked in the smoke. That seemed to calm her down a bit. Where did it happen? She whispered. Where is the witch now? Is she in the hotel? Grandmama, 
I said. It wasn't just one. It was hundreds. They're all over the place. They're right here in the hotel this very moment. She leaned forward and stared at me. You don't mean... You don't actually mean... You, you don't mean... To tell me they're holding the annual meeting right here in the hotel. They've held it, Grandmama. It's finished. I heard it all. And all of them, including the Grand High Witch herself, are downstairs now. They're pretending they're the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. They're all having tea with the manager. And they caught you. They smelt me out, I said. Dog's droppings, was it? She said, sighing. I'm afraid so. But it wasn't strong. They very nearly didn't smell me because I hadn't had a bath for ages. Children should never have baths. My grandmother said, It's a dangerous habit. I agree, Grandmama. She paused, sucking at her cigar. Do you really mean to tell me that they are now all downstairs having tea? She said. I'm certain of it, Grandmama. There was another pause. I could see the old glint of excitement slowly coming back into my grandmother's eyes. And all of a sudden she sat up very straight in her chair and said sharply, Tell me everything, right from the beginning, and please hurry. I took a deep breath and began to talk. I told about going to the ballroom and hiding behind the screen to do my mouse training. I told about the notice saying Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. I told her all about the women coming in and sitting down and about the small woman who appeared on the stage and took off her mask. But when it came to describing what her face looked like underneath the mask, I simply couldn't find the right words. It was horrible, Grandmama, I said. Oh, it was so horrible. It was... it was like something that was going rotten. Go on, my grandmother said. Don't stop. Then I told her about all the others taking off their wigs and their gloves and their shoes and how I saw before me a sea of bald, pimply heads, and how the women's fingers had little claws, and how their feet had no toes. My grandmother had come forward now in her armchair, so that she was sitting right on the edge of it. Both her hands were cupped over the gold knob of the stick that she always used when walking, and she was staring at me with eyes as bright as two stars. Then I told her how the Grand High Witch had shot out the fiery white-hot sparks, and how they had turned one of the other witches into a puff of smoke. I've heard about that, my grandmother cried out excitedly, but I never quite believed it. You were the first non-witch ever to see it happening. It is the Grand High Witch's most famous punishment. It is known as getting fried, and all the other witches are petrified of having it done to them. I am told that the Grand High Witch makes it a rule to fry at least one witch at each annual meeting. She does it in order to keep the rest of them on their toes. But they don't have any toes, Grandmama. 
I know they don't, my darling. But please go on. So then I told my grandmother about the delayed action mouse maker. And when I came to the bit about turning all the children of England into mice, she actually leapt out of her chair, shouting, I knew it! I knew they were brewing up something tremendous! We've got to stop them, I said. She turned and stared at me. You can't stop witches, she said. Just look at the power that terrible Grand High Witch has in her eyes alone. She could kill any of us at any time with those white hot sparks of hers. You saw it yourself. Even so, Grandmama, we've still got to stop her from turning all the children of England into mice. You haven't quite finished, she said. Tell me about Bruno. How did they get him? So, I described how Bruno Jenkins had come in and how I had actually seen him with my own eyes being shrunk into a mouse. My grandmother looked at Bruno, who was guzzling away in the bowl of bananas. Does he never stop eating? she asked. Never, I said. Can you explain something to me, Grandmama? I'll try, she said. She reached out and lifted me off the table and put me on her lap. Very gently, she began stroking the soft fur along my back. It felt nice. What is it you want to ask me, my darling? She said. The thing I don't understand, I said, is how Bruno and I are still able to talk and think, just as we did before. It's quite simple, my grandmother said. All they've done is to shrink you and give you four legs and a furry coat. But they haven't been able to change you into a 100% mouse. You are still yourself in everything except your appearance. You've still got your own mind and your own brain and your own voice. And thank goodness for that. So, I'm not really an ordinary mouse at all, I said. I'm sort of a mouse person. Quite right, she said. You are a human in mouse's clothing. You are very special. We sat there in silence for a few moments while my grandmother went on stroking me very gently with one finger and puffing her cigar with the other hand. The only sound in the room was made by Bruno as he attacked the bananas in the bowl. But I wasn't doing nothing as I lay there on her lap. I was thinking like mad. My brain was whizzing as it had never whizzed before. Grandmama, I said, I may have a bit of an idea. Yes, my darling, what is it? The Grand High Witch told them her room was number 454, right? Right, she said. Well, my room is number 554. Mine, 554, five, is on the fifth floors, so hers, 454, will be on the fourth floor. That 
that is correct, my grandmother said. Then don't you think it's possible that room 454 is directly underneath room 554? That's more than likely, she said. These modern hotels are all built like boxes of bricks. But what if it is? Would you please take me out onto the balcony so I can look down? I said. All the rooms in the Hotel Magnificent had small private balconies. My grandmother carried me through into my own bedroom and out onto my balcony. We both peered down to the balcony immediately below. Now, if that is her room, I said, then I'll bet I could climb down there somehow and get in. And get caught all over again, my grandmother said. I won't allow it. At this moment, I said, all the witches are down on the Sunshine Terrace having tea with the manager. The Grand High Witch probably won't be back until six o'clock or just before. That's when she's going to dish out supplies of that foul formula to the Ancient Ones who are too old to climb trees after Gruntal's eggs. And what if you did manage to get into her room? My grandmother said. What then? Then... I should try to find the place where she keeps her supply of delayed action mouse maker, and if I succeeded, then I would steal one bottle of it and bring it back here. Could you carry it? I think so, I said. It's a very small bottle. I'm frightened of that stuff, my grandmother said. What would you do with it if you did manage to get it? One bottle is enough for 500 people, I said. That would give each and every witch down there a double dose at least. We could turn them all into mice. My grandmother jumped about an inch in the air. We were out on my balcony and there was a drop of about a million feet below us and I very nearly bounced out of her hand over the railings when she jumped. Be careful with me, Grandmama, I said. What an idea, she cried. It's fantastic. It's tremendous. You're a genius, my darling. Wouldn't it be something, I said. Wouldn't that really be something? We'd get rid of every witch in England in one swoop, she cried. And the Grand High Witch into the bargain. We've got to try it, I said. Listen, she said, nearly dropping me over the balcony once again in her excitement. If we brought this off, it would be the greatest triumph in the whole history of witchery. There's a lot of work to do, I said. Of course there's lots of work to do, she said. Just for a start, supposing you did manage to get hold of one of those bottles, how would you get it into their food? We'll work that out later, I said. Let's try to get the stuff first. How can we find out for sure if that's her room just below us? We shall check it out immediately, my grandmother cried. Come along, there's not a second to waste. Carrying me in one hand, she went bustling out of the bedroom and along the corridor, banging her stick on the carpet with each step she took. We went down the stairs, one flight to the fourth floor. The bedrooms on either side of the corridor had their numbers painted on the doors in gold. Here it is, my grandmother cried, number 454. She tried the door. It was locked, of course. She looked up and down the long, empty hotel corridor. I 
do believe you are right, she said. This room is almost certainly directly below yours. She marched back along the corridor, counting the number of doors from the Grand High Witch's room to the staircase. There were six. She climbed back up to the fifth floor and repeated the exercise. She is directly below you, my grandmother cried out. Her room is right below yours. She carried me back into my own bedroom and went out once again onto the balcony. That's her balcony down there, she said. And what's more, the door from her balcony into her bedroom is wide open. How are you going to climb down? I don't know, I said. Our rooms were in the front of the hotel, and they looked down onto the beach and the sea. Immediately below my balcony, thousands of feet below, I could see a fence of spiked railings. If I fell, I'd be a goner. I've got it, my grandmother cried. With me in her hand, she rushed back into her, her own room and began rummaging in the chest of drawers. She came out with a ball of blue knitting wool. One end of it was attached to some needles and a half-finished sock she'd been knitting for me. This is perfect, she said. I shall put you in the sock and lower you down onto the Grand High Witch's balcony. But we must hurry. Any moment now that monster will be returning to her room. Dun, dun, dun. That is the end of chapter four. Goodness, goodness, what a cliffhanger. Here is the plan beginning to be put into action. The grandmother, the old witch hunter, the legend. Back in action, ready to help take down not one witch, not a room of witches, not only all the witches in England, no, but all of the witches in England and the Grand High Witch herself. What a cliffhanger. Will they be successful as the boy is literally hanging from a thread in a sock being dangled over the fifth floor balcony of the Hotel Magnificent. Can he infiltrate the Grand High Witch's hotel room? Acquire one of the bottles of the delayed action mouse maker and then concoct a master plan to poison all the witches of England and the Grand High Witch herself and turn not all the children of England into mice, but to turn all the witches and their leader 
of the world's witches into ice. That would be a turn for the books.